please. Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Morgan? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Yes, staff does have a recommended change to tonight's agenda. We recommend removing item 8D from this evening's agenda. That's the council parental leave item. To be forwarded to a future agenda item. Okay, great. We will do that. Excuse me, Mayor, would you mind if we took a brief five minute break? There's a tech issue and the video feed isn't feeding in. Okay, yeah, we wanna make sure that it's, that it's working. So Thank you. So we'll take a quick five minute break and return momentarily. We have staff working on the issue. We just wanna make sure it's working correctly. Yeah, absolutely.
Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and, and resume for those who are joining on Zoom or I think also watching maybe on any other streaming platform. Um, you won't be able to see any video right now. You will hear the audio and you will see the slides. And since we're about to go into presentations, you don't really need to see us anyway. You'll see the slides for the presentations. So we're gonna go forward with the next two, or excuse me, item three, which is two different presentations. And after that, we will reassess if we can get our video of the actual chambers uh, back for those who are watching. All right, uh, with that, we will move on to item three, our presentations, and we'll start with item 3A, a presentation from O'Neill Sea Odyssey. Welcome, Tracy. Hello, friends, Mayor Brown, council members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to do a little update about the O'Neill Sea Odyssey and just to the opportunity to share our gratitude with working with the city of Capitola and the community grants program. Tonight, I wanted to take a moment and just do kind of a high level overview. I know we only have a few minutes of what is the Sea Odyssey about? Why is it important? Why is it important today? And the work we've been and the progress we've made so far. So I always like to start, the O'Neill Sea Odyssey is really about the ocean is your classroom. It is for all of us. We know, if we can go to the next slide, that the Sea Odyssey was started in 1996 by Jack O'Neill. He had this amazing vision. He used this 65-foot catamaran as a floating classroom, really knowing and understanding, first and foremost, that when you have access to the ocean, you start to build that care, that acknowledgement, that understanding how we are all inextricably connected to the marine ecosystem. So since founding, we've served over 127,000 students with ocean-going programs. We are a one-of-a-kind program in the region where there is no one else that is able to provide this opportunity to get students out on the water. We provide our program 100% for free, really first targeting students here in Santa Cruz County, Santa Clara County, and Monterey County, targeting those youth that would otherwise not be able to get out on the bay in any other way. Um, typically, we have on average about 50% of our students have never been out on a boat on the ocean before. And really what we're about is that idea that when students know more and they care more, they're gonna do more. And we're really trying to get students at that age where it, they are at that fundamental spot, right? To know that they can build these memories. One of my favorite moments is when I walk through town and have people being like, I remember my time on the Sea Odyssey. I remember getting a chance to go. I remember now knowing why I need to pick up my trash. It is some of my favorite things to do. I always like to say, if anyone's having a bad day, call me, I would love to get you out on the water because it, you can't have a bad day when you're out there. But what we're really about is here in the city of Capitola, so many of our residents, so many people come here because of the access to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We see this from our backyard. It is what influences the economy, it what drives people to be here. And if we are not giving youth the opportunity to build that connection, we're missing a huge opportunity. So that's really what this is about. Next slide, please. So just a real high level overview. When a class is selected to participate with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey, it is not just a field trip, which I think many people think it is. It is a comprehensive eight hour field experience. We provide selected teachers with the tools to give class classroom lessons, both in English and in Spanish. We give them a three hour field experience and then really the cornerstone of this is, again, the Sea Odyssey is 100% offered for free. Out of We provide this for the community by the generosity of our community. And what all we ask of our student participants is that they pay it forward, that they get a chance to apply what they've learned with a community service project that is student-led and planned. So next slide. So one thing I always like to hit on, if we can go one more slide, please is just to give you a why now, why is this important? The state of environmental education, and I won't make you read all of that because there's a lot of words up there, but back in 2015, the California Department of Education 
created a blueprint for environmental literacy, basically a pathway to help residents and individuals K to 14 understand what do they need to know to build that authentic connection to the natural world and why is that connection important? Because really, if you look at the bottom there, what is an environmental literate person is about? It is the ability to act individually and collectively to improve and understand the natural world around you. And that is what the O'Neill Sea Odyssey is about. We're not just giving knowledge, but we're really reaching youth at that moment to inspire the next generation of civically minded individuals. Next slide, please. So what did we do here with the city of Capitola? Our community grant that we applied for was a three-year grant and we're working to serve, we had said for four classes from the city of Capitola to provide hands-on STEM-based learning for elementary youth, both in formal and informal settings. So what that means, just to break that down, is to look at not just the classroom experiences, but working with the informal environments such as Camp Capitola and other after school and out of school time learning opportunities. Really thinking more about strategically, how do we not just have the ocean be a one time field experience, but a collective, a, a series of experiences that you can build upon. So over the years, next slide please, we've really started to build on and to think about some of this. We started in the first year with just starting some of the conversations with the recreation team, thinking about and serving the Camp Capitola students, thinking of the older ones that come out and are ready for some of those experiences away from the main camp. We started talking about how can we serve students when they're half days or when there are no school days. And we're turning to work with the instructors there and think more about how can we keep to build this out. Next slide. Last year, we served our four classes from Capitola. I think you're gonna recognize a couple of those faces up there, but what they, we were so, served classes from SoCal Union and New Brighton Middle School. And as we look forward to the year we're in currently, we again have our four classes scheduled for this year. We have the classes from Camp Capitola as well as four classes from the SoCal Union Elementary School. If you wanna go up, next slide, thank you. And as we're looking to for this year, not all the students have come out this year, but as we're really starting to build out our vision for this year and going forward, we're continuing the conversations, the funds that have come from the city of Capitola for, through these community grant programs have allowed us to leverage these dollars to bring in more dollars, to bring in and think critically about other pathways of support for to expand these services. So really what we're looking at is thinking more about not just the field experience, but we've been able to leverage these dollars for county core funding, for state funding to really enhance the professional development sort of experiences. So we're really starting to think more about offering hands-on teacher training, thinking about next generation, how can we offer more transportation scholarships, how can we continue to reach and eliminate any of those barriers that are gonna prevent students from accessing the coasts and oceans that we know and love so well. Next slide. So one of the cornerstones, and I wanted to highlight this because I think this is really impactful. Again, cornerstone of the Sea Odyssey experiences are these student action projects. So of this projects that have been done with the classes that have participated so far, and these are just preliminary numbers, we're gonna continue to gather more data as we go on. Next slide, please. We've, students have done beach cleanups. Not only have they done beach cleanups there here at the beach, but they've done campus cleanups on their school campus and in local watersheds. They've collected hundreds of pounds of trash and we're continuing to look at how do we better capture that information so that we can understand the second tier of impact for students that come throughout our program. Next slide, please. Other projects included student public service announcements. Um, students then took the opportunity to educate younger students. They not only took what they learned, but they shared it with their friends and family. They went back to school and talked to the younger elementary age students, whether that be with a direct lesson about recycling, or maybe they were making signs to share at campus about Earth Day and how do we kind of continue these messages going forward. 
Um, if you ever, I have some fun videos that I would love to share at one point of students, you know, technology is so readily accessible these days. They've made some really great PSAs that are fun to share. Next slide, please. So just to give a quick snapshot, the funds, again, that we have been generously provided have covered about 50% of the, of the costs associated with these programs. We then continue to leverage and fundraise through our donors, through outside grants to fund the other 43% of the classes that are served from this area. And there is still more demand and need. So we're looking to kind of figure out how do we ramp that up even further. Next slide. Just to kind of finally summarize, right? So our outcomes, the things that we're really trying to improve and touch upon is that students know more, right? They gain more knowledge through the O'Neill Sea Odyssey experience. They know more, they know how to take action, and they do more by talking to their friends and family. So if you go to the next slide, one of the things, this is from last year, we're just in the getting ready to produce this year's report, but this gives you a snapshot from how the Sea Odyssey really does start to make an impact. We do do an evaluation with our students, both before and after the boat trip, during their experience, and we see on average at least a 20% increase in a student's environmental awareness after participating in the Sea Odyssey experience. We, this does not reflect here, but we have gone back five to seven years later, and that number still remains high in terms of what they retain from that experience. We really do work to serve those students from our, that are selected in the program. So they represent the community that we're in and represent the multilingual learners that are here as well. So we're really working to reflect who we are. And so last but not least, it's always good to know who's the Sea Odyssey. We are the education we need for the world that we want, for the environment and for the community we aim to build for ourselves. So I really want to thank the city of Capitola for your generosity and for the opportunity to partner with all of you. And I look forward to kind of continuing this as we go forward. Can I answer any questions? Thank you. Any questions? No? Questions? Comments? No? Tracy, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I have had the opportunity to tag along with one of the classrooms, and it's amazing to see these young people and how enthralled they are in learning about our natural environment. Um, just the work you're doing is truly marvelous. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are grateful for the support. And if you haven't been out, there's a lovely humpback that's right outside here. So if you get a chance to go, well, could just go stand on the coast. She's, she's making her appearance. Thank you. Julia, it looks like we have video back. So just letting everyone know you should be able to see us now, for better or for worse. Um, we will move on now to item 3B, presentation from Vista Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Hi, welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Sophia Boylan. I am the branch manager of our Santa Cruz location of Vista Center. And I'll be sharing with you a little bit today um, about what we do for our clients and how we serve the community, thanks to your generous support. Next slide, please. Um, so our main goal at Vista Center is to empower individuals who are blind or visually impaired to embrace life through the fullest, through evaluation, counseling, education, and training. Um, we do hope to restore hope. Um, the biggest thing that we hope is for independence for our clients increasing opportunities, transforming lives and confidence. Next slide, please. Uh, vision loss can be a daunting life challenge. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, some of our clients uh, lose their vision gradually. For others, it's more sudden. Um, but it can bring up fears about daily tasks, loss of independence, and diminished self-esteem, unfortunately. The number of visually impaired people living in California is expected to double by 2050. Uh, in the coming years, there will be an increased need for our services in this community. Next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> um, so many of the clients that we serve are seniors, 65% um, of those who are visually impaired and 82% 80 of all blind people are age 50 or older. Vision loss can be caused by congenital conditions, age, disease, or even injury as well. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned, um, Vista Center Santa Cruz is, is part of a larger Vista Center organization. We do have three branches uh, in Palo Alto and San Jose as well. So we were originally founded in 1936 as Palo Alto Society for the Blind. Uh, locally, we joined with the Doran Blind Center in Santa Cruz in 2003. We have been Vista Center since then. Um, and we also have Santa Clara Valley Blind Center, which is uh, merged with Vista Center in 2018, our largest branches in San Jose. Um, so as you can see, Vista Center has a longstanding history and legacy of serving clients in this community. And we're very proud of that. Um, we are a full service vision loss provider um, in the counties of San Mateo, Santa Clara, San Benito, and Santa Cruz counties um, and beyond that. Those are our general service areas, but we do see any clients that need our help. Um, locally in the Bay Area, we serve close to 4,000 clients a year um, that have vision loss and really see clients from every age, um, as young as three, all the way up to 107. Um, and those are real numbers. We do have clients that come for our services every week who are in their hundreds um, and, and happy to receive our services. Our diverse board of directors represents our community. Um, we have many uh, board members and staff members who do have visual impairments um, or are blind themselves. Our CEO, Cray Lyle, um, has extensive nonprofit and private sector leadership experience. Um, she has a business degree from Harvard um, and is a great leader for our team. Um, and those of us under her, our, the rest of the leadership team, um, represent a balance of experience and emerging talent. Next slide, please. What makes Vista Center different? Um, we do expend, uh, extend support and learning after a medical diagnosis by providing personal plans for each client based on their needs and wants. For every client, that's a little bit different. Um, so we really do like to meet clients where they're at and serve them in ways that help them meet their own goals. 85% um, of our clients do not pay for our services um, based on the generous support that we receive from donors and grantors in the community. Um, and one thing that's very unique about Vista Center is that we do provide itinerant services in a client's home um, if that's needed for them. Many uh, vision centers do not do that. Um, okay. Uh, some examples of the programs and services we provide are um, typically starts with a low vision evaluation. That's the clinical aspect of what we do. Um, and then clients in their journey flow into the programs and services that include um, instruction on daily living skills like safe cooking, um, assistive technology training, youth services, um, and also community services um, programs that happen out and about in Santa Cruz. Uh, county. I don't know if you've ever seen us in a community. I have a few pictures to show you guys at the end. Um, next slide, please. So how do we serve our clients? Um, we like to take a holistic approach. Um, there are both mental and physical aspects um, of vision loss, and our organization is happy to help our clients with both. Uh, we provide social and emotional support through things like support groups, uh, physical empowerment, and help create pathways to goals um, whether that's related to school, work, travel, or recreation. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the Vision Loss Rehabilitation Program uh, is to support and teach the necessary skills to an individual who is losing or has lost their vision so as to maintain or regain their independence. Um, again, we work with clients on teaching them skills like cooking, self-care, home management, organization, um, safe commuting and traveling on public transportation and airplanes, um, staying connected to family, friends, school, uh, work, and the community, um, and also empowerment programs um, for clients to advocate for themselves. So the services funded by um, the generous grant that you've awarded our organization um, are needs assessments and counseling, safe and healthy living instruction, support groups, um, such as adjustment to vision loss is one of our support groups and low vision evaluation and visual aids. Next slide, please. So some of the vision loss rehabilitation activities for safe and healthy living, just to dive a little deeper, include daily living skills, um, orientation and mobility, which is travel training, assistive technology and low vision services, such as uh, evaluations and uh, needs assessments for devices. 
Next slide. So in fiscal year 24, Vista Center provided services to 279 residents of Santa Cruz County, 21 of which live in Capitola, and 15 of them were directly funded through this grant that you provided us. Um, Vista Center is the only provider of vision loss services, uh, vision loss rehabilitation services, excuse me, for the blind and visually impaired residents of the city of Capitola and all of Santa Cruz County. Um, and one thing that does make us very unique is that there is no um, end date to the services we provide to our clients. We offer continued support over time, and many of our clients have been receiving our services for 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, um, and their needs change over time. Technology changes over time, so we're happy to continue serving them for as long as they need our support. Next slide. Um, so just to, to, oops, I'm sorry, just to touch on uh, outcome evaluation, um, we do use certain metrics to evaluate the success of our programs. Um, I personally uh, collect these surveys from clients, um, and it's, it's my pleasure to do so. Um, our client, we have a goal of 85% uh, success rate for our programs, and out of the surveys we collected, 100% of clients reported better mental health, increased confidence for daily living and mobility skills, and most importantly, increased independence and knowledge of community resources. Next slide. Uh, so the last uh, couple slides here, uh, I just wanted to include some photos of um, Vista Center and the community. This is one of uh, my personally favorite programs. They're called Orientation and Mobility Walks, um, and a group of, of clients will go out in the community once a month, different trails, different pathways uh, throughout the county, um, and practice their orientation and mobility uh, travel skills with each other um, and also receiving sort of that emotional support um, as many of our clients do face isolation. Next slide. Is that just another picture of our clients um, practicing their skills on the boardwalk? Um, okay. Vista Center board, leadership, staff, and program participants thank the city of Capitola for its funding, support, and community partnership. Um, we really do love our clients and we're very happy to serve them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here this evening and for the work that you do. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Okay. Thank you again. All right. Uh, we are going to move on now to what? Item four, additional materials. And it looks like we had quite a few. We had additional materials this evening for items 8B, 8C, and 8D, which has been removed from the agenda tonight. One email was received for 8B and one letter for 8C. All additional materials are available for public review online in the agenda packet at the back of the room. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will go now to item 5, oral communications by members of the public. This is an opportunity for the public to address the council on any items not on tonight's agenda or on items on our consent agenda. You will have three minutes. Uh, go ahead and state your name if you would like it recorded uh, in the record. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Janet Edwards. I live in an unincorporated area of Santa Cruz, but off of Gross Road, and I travel through Capitola all the time. And I missed... Um, your meeting on the work you're gonna do on 41st. So I came to put in my two cents worth of the traffic I see on 41st. Um, the first worst place is Claire's and 41st and it involves northbound um, from on 41st and people turning left from the mall onto to, um, on to 41st. The cars go through the red light all the time. And a lot of times they stop in the middle of the intersection and don't move for a few minutes. They sometimes block not only the right lane, but the other two lanes and even the left turn lane from cars going southbound. It, it's a nightmare and it's frightening if you're going through there. My suggestion is that you start ticketing these people who stop in, in the intersection and maybe people will learn not to do this. Also, I noticed today that 
the worst thing is somebody making a U-turn from going southbound and they wind up for sure blocking that lane. And I know that people would appreciate it if that area could move a little faster. It's better than it used to be, but it's still bad. And I know it's the freeway. Um, the other part is one that really affects me, and that's Gross Road going east to north 41st, and most of the people are trying to get on Highway 1 South. The problem is that light is too short. Sometimes I've even been the first car trying to go left, and I barely moved before the whole thing turned yellow. So it's, it's terrible, and we've had a lot of traffic. It's certainly worse while they're constructing and there are days where it can take half an hour to come from South Rodeo Gulch to 41st, where it's a minute or two on a normal day. So um, we would appreciate it if you would lengthen that time. Um, when somebody uses the crosswalk, it's 25 seconds. Other times it's a lot less than that, like five or 10 seconds even. Um, and it, it can be all day. Sometimes it's, you know, in the afternoon, but a lot of times it's just in um, um, rush hour traffic. But we would appreciate some help. And so I will turn this in. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. You can. Hi, welcome. I didn't do this right the last time. Okay, hi, my name is Terry Thomas, and I am here to ask the city council if they would please strongly request that the officers of the police department spend much more time on Park Avenue giving out tickets especially while the ramp is closed for the next month and a half. Yesterday morning, I went out to pick up the garbage cans on the street, and I saw cars going at least 45 miles an hour, and I'm yelling at them to slow down. My husband's about ready to disown me because of it, because I do it all the time. But I shouldn't be the police officer, and you guys are missing out on a lot of revenue because you're not ticketing people on Park Avenue. Please ask them to, to get out there and do something. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. My name's Cheryl Dan. And I really appreciate the opportunity to have oral arguments um, and competition here. Commentary, I mean, get a little nervous. Um, I'm addressing you tonight in response to the September 26th meeting about the Noble Gulch Dog Park. And um, staff made time to meet with the dog owners and gather their input. And yet, as, um, as far as I know, property owners, and I wasn't notified of um, a meeting or input, and I did send a letter, and I'm assuming the City Council and the Planning Commission got it. I didn't receive any acknowledgement of that or asked to be part of any meetings. So I just wanted to let you know that, that um, it was part of a piece from my perspective that was left out. Anyway, I wanted to make a couple comments, and... Um, it doesn't appear that there's any sound mitigation being addressed in the proposed plan as I looked it over. And the quiet of enjoyment of the property owners and other park users, I think, is at risk. Um, if you've been to the park, you can see it's very tranquil, uh, even though there are, there's traffic and cars going by. Um, there, the dogs bark. We all know that. They also fight at dog parks. And owners raise their voices, and there's neighbors. So, and there's two more thoughts that I have. You know, there, we have, um, have the birds in the area been recognized and considered? Because years ago, there was a skate park that wanted to try and locate in the Noble Gulch Park. And the consideration was about the birds. 
and the noise. So I just thought I would bring that up. Also, I realized the cost, about 80,000, depending on what is added to it, is a really added burden to the city and to the public, especially at a time when we're trying to raise funds for more revenue for the city. So anyway, I know it's hard to find solutions, you know, to, so it doesn't negatively impact the neighbors and also the dog owners to have a place. I really appreciate this. Um, some ideas, because we're working or on, especially tonight, for the Capitola Mall. Maybe um, we're envisioning uh, the mall with a place for the dog park. Um, also, maybe Jade Street is being reworked. Maybe there's something to be there. Also, McGregor does have an existing dog park, and maybe that can be improved upon. So anyway, I really appreciate um, you listening and taking the time, and if you want to get in touch with me, I did. I sent a letter to everybody. Cheryl Band's my name. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, Marilyn Garrett. <clears throat> We've heard of five G phones, cell towers, etc. Graphene oxide is a compound of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen in various ratios, which can be formed into ultra-thin layers about one nanometer thick. Graphene's high conductivity and flexibility makes it the linchpin of 5G wireless technology, as it is a super absorber of microwaves. Graphene oxide transistors are in every 5G transmission device. Frequencies in the 5G range operate at more potent power densities than those in the 4G range. A recent paper in Annals of Case Reports by EMF researcher Dr. Leonard Hardell indicates that exposure to the high frequencies and power density of 5G results in a host of neurological symptoms, such as tinnitus, fatigue, insomnia, emotional distress, skin disorders, and blood pressure variability. The references are here. Moreover, the high energy consumed by 5G cells is discharged into the air, exposing plants, animals, and humans to unprecedented levels of electricity. But there's more. Researchers in both Spain and the UK have found graphene oxide in the COVID vaccines and have observed strange transistor-like structures in the blood of COVID vaccine individuals, raising the possibility that 5G frequencies can communicate with the graphene oxide structures in the blood. Moreover, a 2020 study in Toronto found the graphene oxide nanoparticles showed excellent selective sensing ability towards adrenaline and tyrosine. Now, let's put all this together. Vaccinated athletes pumped up in an adrenaline rush, performing in stadium environments of intense Wi-Fi and other frequencies, fall over with cardiac arrest. The last two years have seen over 1,000 such deaths. Coincidence? We think not. This is from Wise Tradition, Spring 2023. I'll give you a copy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, Council. I'm Matt Arthur. I'm a member of the uh, BIA, actually board member of the BIA. I'm just up here to let you guys know and remind you that about a month from yesterday is our sip and throw that's going to take place down in Capitola Village. Uh, it's uh, November 9th from 12 to 5. Tickets are going to be available uh, in the community room just behind us here. $45. I know how much you guys appreciate and support the uh, local businesses down here. It's going to be a great event. So this is a reminder just to you guys. Love to see you guys out there participate. 
um, but also a reminder to the community. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It is a great event. I volunteered at several sip and strolls. They're a lot of fun. Hi, welcome. Good evening. Um, I'm, my name is Karen Hanna. Um, my mom was the founder of the Doran Resource Center for the Blind, which merged with the Palo Alto Blind Center and created the Vista Center. So it's uh, something very close to our family. But I just want to reiterate all the great things the Vista Center does. It's such an amazing resource for a community of this size. There are so many, you know, with all the medical deserts that are out there and places where hospitals are closing and people just can't get services. The things that the Vista Center offers are life changing for from little kids to um, adults. My mom was a brailer and she had a student from um, kindergarten all the way till he graduated from high school who did all, all his brailing for him and, and did things that allowed him to participate in classes to make him not unusual from his classmates. And um, he even came to her funeral when she passed. So uh, it's an amazing organization. So I just wanted to say if anybody knows anybody who's losing their vision, we have so many seniors here, the hardest thing about the Vista Center and the work they do is getting the word out because people just don't know it exists. And um, so if you know anybody who is losing their vision or has lost their vision, the technology that they keep up with, having a low vision clinic in a community this size is miraculous. Because if you're a senior and they say, well, you have to go to you know San Francisco for low vision evaluation, it's probably not gonna happen. So it's, it's absolutely life changing. So anybody that you know that you can spread the word about the Vista Center and what they offer, their office is right over there by Dominican Hospital and um, it's just a great organization. So I appreciate uh, the city of Capitola supporting them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hello, good evening, mayor, council members, staff. Um, I'm Melinda Orbach. Um, I just want to say that I was here at the Chambers last Wednesday. There was a candidate forum for, forum for me and Margo and Jerry, as well as Enrique, um, where residents got to hear from all four of us and what our ideas and priorities are for Capitola to make it a better place to live. It was a great evening of thoughtful and respectful sharing of ideas, and I'm so grateful for all the candidates for stepping up. Um, for due to the love of, their, of our community. We're, I think we're stronger because of it. For folks who missed that exciting evening, you can see it on my website, melinda-orbach.com. Um, also to report that last Tuesday next door at the community um, room, we had a strategic plan meeting hosted by the city and Barry Dunn. Um, it, I think it, there was a great turnout, great conversation. I applaud this council for having the vision to initiate that process because it's the first ever uh, that we're doing a strategic plan for the next five years uh, uh, in terms of what we want to prioritize. As with previous city outreach efforts, my biggest con concern is this great idea for this, with this great idea is the lack of public participation. Um, so, you know, I've taken the initiative to um, include outreach for the strategic plan as part of my campaign. Whether I win or lose in this election, I think breaking down barriers to civic engagement is what I care deeply about. We need to ensure this effort continues and I urge folks to go online and complete the survey. Uh, I was also at the Get Out to Vote, We Vote rally on Monday at the, court, at the courthouse and I, I urge folks to create a plan to vote. There are a lot of um, different measures uh, on the ballot this year and it takes time to really do your research and dig in. Um, some of the reasons why I'm voting is, you know, I care about protecting the, our freedoms to love who we love, to be who we wanna be, and to do as we wish with our bodies, and to protect those around us who are disenfranchised, marginalized, and oppressed. Our next president will also likely be appointing the next two Supreme Court justices, and we know how important they are, as evidenced by the reversal of Roe v. Wade. So please make a plan to, to, to vote y'all. Um, also, please vote yes on Measure Y. Thank you.
Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Not running to get up here. Hey, you know, when you get to be my age, it just happens to one foot in front of the other. I am impressed. My first time here, I look back here, I call it a community table. I'm Richard Lewis. You don't need to know no board, no staff, but some relationships go back a long time. Can't transfer in three minutes, but we'll take later more time. If you just take time to see the board and the staff of America's Promise, brand new idea to fine tune, I'd like your feedback, bring the Capitola Capitola's promise. What is your promise to our children and youth? I'm here because I heard you've got a plan for over here at the mall. And so all I can do is say hello. No board, no staff. But with the police chief back here, we're going to introduce the idea of an initiative called End Crime Inc. We don't have to worry about money. We have to worry about next November some women sitting and running our county. I'm not worried. Um, those who don't know me, my invitation, which is big, is only less than 100 people voted at Cabrillo for the student government. Take it local. Come over on Thursday yourself to student government and get behind my friend who was trying to create a strategy, we need help, to create a for-profit business, that's Ted Burke, that would put 100% of his money, like Paul Newman did, back to student government. So look, at, I'm not a politician. Those that know my family, Bob and Jack Lewis, I'm the younger brother who never tried to make money, but that's Lewis Volkswagen. All I can do is, wasn't gonna get up there. What a beautiful room. Community. Let's let's make this table a possibility, but let's wait till November. So please, America's promise, see the board, that's General Powell, and see what you can do to fine-tune the idea of what we could do at the mall in that former Red Lobster building. You know I'm gonna connect and give me my vote when I go home. But come on, look at who's there your neighbors. I hope I made sense. I don't see, I got 25 seconds. Um, in the history, the county is moving through a youth structure. How come Capitola, Capitola couldn't have a youth mayor and a youth city council? It's up to you. Thank you. I'll be back. I mean, this is a beautiful room. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Galen, you know me, but um, I just have two points this evening. One is I totally want to reiterate what the, the one uh, woman was saying about the traffic. In my four trips in the last two days, I've seen a young woman go through Hill and Capitola right up uh, Army Bay, right out and up Hill at 25 miles per hour. She did not even stop. Um, I've seen two or three cars that are going 30 to 45 miles per hour down park. And even yesterday coming back from Ace Hardware and Aptos, um, because someone wanted to get through the traffic, they cut into the newly paved uh, center section that uh, Granite Construction has put and cut um, through that construction all the way down to Park Avenue in four trips. Okay, so we have a serious problem and we all know sitting here, it's not gonna get better in the next couple of years because there's that much construction going on with Granite. So this city council needs to take some action and needs to help the police uh, department with some policies and, and some things that we can do to resolve that working with the county too. <clears throat> the second thing is, I think we're all recognizing that it's becoming trying times and really challenging for this city. And it has such a unique and quaint history and, and uniqueness to it um, that, that separates it from so many other cities across the country. Um, so the bottom line is what I'm requesting for the council is um, after the election and moving into 2025, um, I'd like to see the council uh, come up with a committee to evaluate putting some criteria in for running for city council. For example, I think you should at least have lived in the city for five years. 
um, I think you maybe should have participated in the Capitola City Government um, um, course that they've had, some other things like that. I think it's too important for this city to just let anybody come up and try and run for the city council. I think you have to understand the city, understand the history, understand the volunteerism that exists, and, and appreciate what, what we have here and how we can continue. <clears throat> Excuse me, continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Welcome back. It's been the first time. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, again, greetings all, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to make a statement um, with a different hat on as a commissioner for the Commission on the Environment. Um, I want to make sure everyone was aware of a historic vote earlier this week from the Board of Supervisors banning all filtered cigarette products in the county of Santa Cruz. Um, part of that is it will go into effect not until January 1, 2027, but it is important that each of the municipalities really step up and also consider endorsing this and also passing your own ban in your jurisdiction. Um, cigarette butts remain the number one item that is found in, on in any public beach walkway um, regularly. Those little cigarette butts are made from cellulose acetate, a single-use plastic that not only infiltrates our lives and our lungs, but the lives and lungs of all of the inhabitants, plants, animals, and humans. It is causing so much toxicity um, throughout our ocean column and in our own lives. Um, Annually, the county spends upwards of $2 million to clean up those that trash, and those funds could be put to such much better use. So I respectfully request that you consider putting this on a future agenda, and I appreciate your awareness of it. Thanks. Thank you. Any further public comment tonight? Okay. Seeing none, thank you, everyone, for your comments this evening. We will bring it back to staff and city council comments, and we'll start with staff. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Just one quick announcement for the council and for the community. We are recruiting for all boards and commissions right now. We would love to see more applications come in. So if you're interested in serving this city, please consider stopping by our website and applying for a board or commission. Uh, get your applications in by Thanksgiving. And then I think we have a comment from our public works director about Unfortunately, we have some relatively unfun news about traffic. Uh, not our project, but we thought it's a good opportunity to inform the community about a pending project that's going to happen within our city limits. Uh, good evening, Mayor Council members. Again, not our project, um, but Will and Peck, the uh, west side of town. Unfortunately, county sanitation discovered in the past few weeks that they have a serious problem on one of their sewer mains on Capitol Avenue near the Clare Street intersection. So they have gotten right on it. They have granite construction under contract and they are gonna start that work next Wednesday, the 16th and expect it to last for three weeks. So during that time and when you're coming into town on uh, Capitola Road, excuse me, Capitola Road, you will not be able to make that left into the Clare Street loop there by the mall. Um, there will be other times where the traffic will be impacted. We are working with the county with their um, traffic impacts and their traffic um, control plan. Uh, the clerk's office has prepared some social media to put that information out to the public. And as you may recall, we had a major CIP on Capitola Road last year, which the county will be required to completely restore at the end of their project. Thank you. Any other staff comments? No? Okay, we'll bring it to the council. Council comments? Oh, just kidding. Not yet. All right. Hi, Chief. I was going to say something good about the police department, too. <laughs> I just want, uh, good evening, everyone, Mayor, Council. Um, I just wanted to address the, the council and then the community. We have been hearing the outpour of, um, of the concerns up in the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood and all the construction that's going on on Bay Avenue. Uh, we have increased our patrolling, um, patrol up there. So I, we have overtime shifts that have been authorized. But again, this is kind of a band-aid with it right now. There's a tremendous amount of road work being done. Um, we're addressing it. We're addressing it like with our new attempt and overtime. But it's one of those things that we're getting back and rehuddling and looking at everything and looking at all the different projects and looking at it from a, a variety of different ways. But enforcement is one of those things that we've definitely stepped it up. Um, it's uh, con congestion. There's a lot of frustration. It's gridlock at one point, and then there's people speeding, just 
you know, really abusing those neighborhoods. We, we hear the complaints from people. Um, we're, we're stepping forward, and like I said, with our enforcement of it, but we need to look at this from a, a, a much bigger holistic, you know, uh, way because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a major issue. So uh, if you have any more comments or questions with that, I'm happy to, like I said, we've been responding to all the emails and interactions, and then we're going to, at some point, uh, have some sort of community meeting, but we got to get our heads around everything that's going on because there's just, there's just a lot of different, uh, a lot of different projects up there. Thank so you. appreciate that. Before you leave, are you, uh, would you be interested in sharing about why you have pink patches on? Oh, yes. Uh, October is our um, cancer awareness month. And so it's a pink patch. Uh, so the month of uh, October will be wearing pink patches in support of the cancer awareness. So all of our uniform personnel will be wearing that for the month of um, October. And the POA then will accept donations and then we donate it to a local cause. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, we'll bring it now to council. Geez, we just can't catch a break on the traffic. It's uh, it's not going to get better for, uh, very soon. But what I'd like to give a shout out to the, uh, the police department of social media. Um, they continue to do the education on e-bikes, which is a, a big thing. Um, also, the traffic issue. That's another another good thing they can do. They can put stuff out about traffic, and people can connect to the to the police department. So reach out to the social media for the police department. They do a great job of. Uh, getting things out there for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my comment was just, I wanted to touch base with the PD just to, I know we're getting an influx of information on different areas and, um, but I'm glad to hear that there's some stuff, some measures being taken. So I want to take that seriously. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would be interested in having some more information on the filtered cigarette ban come back to council, either from um, representatives from uh, the county or other organizations like the Surfrider Foundation who are involved in that project. Um, and I would also like to request that we look into an economic development committee and that that be brought back to I know we had one at some point in the past, uh, and I have talked to members of the BIA about that possibility and getting concerted efforts towards um, ensuring our fiscal health in the long term. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just as a reminder to our community, there, we do have a strategic planned survey online. We've touched on it multiple times. We are trying our best to get that information out to you and deliver to you, um, just not in an online forum, but to every single committee if you're on one. Um, also, today was um, bike to and or walk to school day. And I was really, really disappointed in our drivers today, um, especially at the Bay and Hill intersection quick build. Um, I'd really like staff, Jamie, if you guys um, can come back to us or in a Friday update, um, let us know about all of the construction that's coming our way. One of the things that we have control over is Bay and Hill um, intersection quick build. And right now I'm not feeling as if it's safe, creating a safer situation for our pedestrians and our bicyclists at this point. And it really, really concerns me that it's not being as effective as we at all hoped for um, in addition or in correlation with the on-ramp being closed and the bridge being closed. And I know staff have, has worked really hard on this, but this is something that is heightened. I saw so many people and kids today almost get hit at this intersection. And because I know council, this was our priority for safety, it's not feeling that way. And I'm hearing it from the community all the time. Um, even one of our police officers said he saw something in Watsonville where they're walking across the street with flags just to make it safer. There's some really easy things we can do in the meantime. Um, but I'd like for staff to come back um, with information on all the pro projects um, that are taking place or are in the coffers to us and um, to have this Bay and Hill intersection come back to council sooner um, than we had uh, anticipated for. There's We've paused the study already because um, we're not able to collect actual data on if this is effective or not. It's just really impacting us more than, than I really hoped for, um, and it's not making it safer. Um, so I'd like to see that. And then also we had two great presentations from our grant um, recipients. 
I'm not sure if all grant recipients have been notified that they need to report out to us. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm sure we'll hear from um, all of them as well. Um, and then I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I have a couple comments. I will start uh, by thanking those who gave presentations this evening. Um, I, I'm not sure that everyone in the community is aware of the diversity of services and programs that are available to us. Um, and so I think I hope I hope that by being here today and sharing um, what your programs do, um, that someone who might be in need of your services or a school who might be interested in bringing youth on the water will hear that and um, know to reach out. So I'm really excited that you were here today. Um, I want to respond uh, to the question about the dog park that was mentioned during public comment. Um, it's still not finalized. There's still room for improvements. We're working on it, uh, and it'll be coming back to uh, council at a future date for finalization. Um, we're not spending any money on it yet because we don't have it. So uh, we'll be working on, on kind of fundraising in that regard too, but we hear you, and please do stay tuned. We welcome your feedback as we continue in the process. Um, in that same kind of vein of feedback and, and reaching out and whatnot, um, a member of the public notified me that a concerned citizen was worried about the benches on the wharf not being installed. Um, the benches, I understand, that have not been installed yet are not installed because they are going to be in places where the food trucks and the bandstand were. Um, and so they are to be installed this month, correct? Okay, so they are to be installed this month. I know social media can feel like a good way to blow off some steam, but if you're looking to make a difference, please reach out to the council directly. We would love to hear from you. And you know, if you want action, we gotta hear uh, what your concerns are. So let us know, we're all here, council and staff. Um, we are a city known for accomplishing great things together, so let's continue that reputation. Um, and also kind of in that same uh, vein about um, another comment that was made during public comment. Uh, we do have quite a few youth programs here in the city of Capitola that we're very proud of. We do have a Youth Mayor for a Day program. It's an essay contest that uh, we're going to be hearing from our youth mayors in the coming weeks. Uh, we've got youth seats on our boards and commissions. We have a dedicated children's fund. We have a youth civic mentorship program that we just started. The, what is it? The liaisons. liaisons. Yes, thank you. Um, and then we have a, a Youth and Children's Bill of Rights as well here in the city of Capitola. So, um, there's always room for uh, more input on any additional youth related projects or programs uh, because they are the future and we got to make sure that they're set up for success. Uh, and then finally, I will share, oh no, not finally, almost finally, I will start, <laughs> uh, I will comment also on the traffic that we've all been experiencing, the speeding. Just a reminder, let's all exercise patience and deep breathing. Uh, and be good neighbors. I know it's very frustrating with all of the uh, construction that's going on right now. Uh, it'll be worth it in the long run, but in the meantime, uh, we're experiencing a lot of folks who are just frustrated, and, and so let's all try to control our, our own frustration and be patient with each other. And now, finally, uh, Monty Fireworks Show on Sunday. Really looking forward to that. Um, I, I apologize, I needed to have the details in front of me and I don't. So can someone share with me the time that it will start? And I know that the beach is gonna be closed. Chief, would that be, do you, right after sunset? Okay. Right after sunset. The beach itself is actually open. It's oh, the it wharf is? that's closed. Oh, the wharf, thank you. Yeah, the wharf a, is closed, the beach is open. There's a buffer zone, I believe Hooper's is closed, but. Okay. All right, that's gonna be exciting. I'm really looking forward to, to having that come back. All right. I think that's it for me. All right. Okay, great. We are gonna move on now to our consent agenda, item seven. Uh, all of these items will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below, unless any member of the council would like to pull an item from consent. Okay, hearing none, uh, we will entertain a motion. I can move the consent agenda 7A and B. I'll second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll go to item 8A, Netherlands Transportation Study Visit. Do you? All right, I know we had Vice Mayor Brooks and Kailash sure. went to the Netherlands. Hi, welcome. Hi, I'll be some begin, but I don't Great. start this. Yeah, so as many of you know, I recently had the amazing opportunity to join Ecology Action um, 
uh, an Ecology Action paid trip as a city delegate to the Netherlands, where we dove deep um, into their bike infrastructure and how it connects to mobility, safe streets, and economic growth. Um, to be honest, um, um, what was excitement at first returned into nervousness for me because I actually have never traveled that far from my family, and um, I honestly couldn't remember the last time I rode a bike. So, um, you know, and also I didn't know much about ecology action. I thought maybe I signed up for some, like, bike cult or something, like, that was going to try to change. So, um, but after several planning meetings and a few practice bike rides, I soon became, became fully immersed in what I could confidently call a trip of a lifetime, thanks to Ecology Action. What I discovered is that building a more connected cap, uh, community like we hope to achieve, as we're all living through all this traffic right now, requires significant effort. I noticed that in the, Nether um, the, that the Netherlands actually face similar challenges as we do with super congested freeways and dense populations and the same growth that we're seeing here in our county. Um, so despite having efficient strategies and growing their freeways as, as much as they could and robust train systems and bus routes, um, they, that just wasn't enough. And for decades, the, uh, the Dutch have taken bold steps in creating what we, what I was able to discover as really these beautiful walking and bike paths in this great network that you'll hear from um, Ecology Action and a little bit about. Um, so they began developing these protected bike lanes and, and paths to create a more connected community, sustainable, and one where residents actually could navigate safety, safely, as I was talking about early, earlier, and that people had a choice on the mode of transportation that they wanted to take. So if you were a, you just love your car and you needed to get on that freeway, you still could do that. But if you lived in a community as small as ours, you can get on a bike and safely uh, ride to school or you could walk easily to Knob Hill or to the mall. It was just really interesting to see and observe all of this. Um, so today, the Netherlands is an, a living example of how smart infrastructure can improve mobility. I am no expert, but um, what I really was hoping uh, to bring back here and to explore more was just creating safer streets. We saw the congestion in front of New Brighton Middle School today, and again, what we're hearing at Park Avenue. Um, this is just not safe, livable opportunities for any of us. And so um, some of the things you'll hear from today from this group is about who they are and share a little bit about more of what we've done um, and then also Kalosh was able to attend with me. And so I was really happy that I got to go with an expert because they literally were in the streets measuring, like Kalosh, for you, did you bring the measuring tape? I can't remember who did it, but they were hopping off bikes and measuring roads and seeing if a car could fit with the bike lane. It was just, again, it was just really cool to see um, what were successes. I'll add though that with all those six, the current successes, there were many failures. And I know I mentioned Hilt and Bay today, and I know it's a touchy subject, but sometimes you have to try things to see if it's going to work, fail, and then try again so that we can find success in, in really creating a livable um, community that's safe for everybody. So I'll turn it over to Matt here, who will... Um, we're going to actually Kalosh? show a video first. Oh, the video, yes. And okay, I, let's get to tee up the thing. video then. Yeah. Thanks. Cycling Do we have sound? And we are trying to improve the situation on cycling. Can we put a mic up near the computer we speaker? It seemed clear to us that they do more than just these pink bike workshops. They also offer these study visits. So they will help you organize a delegation of mayors, vice mayors, council members, county supervisor, city manager, director of public works, planners and engineers across all the jurisdictions. And if you go to the Netherlands, visit the experience what all of those cycling look like. 
excited to have this opportunity. I want to improve our community and really our quality of life. I was just out looking at all the, the bike facilities and how they're integrated with everything. I'm beginning to get a sense of what it can be. I went to stress that it's around 50 years ago when it started with implementing dedicated cycling policies and planning efforts and investments. And that's the main reason why cycling is big in the Netherlands. Matt, what have you learned so far? Oh man, where do I even begin? The use of color is coming through pretty strongly. They have the red, the red asphalt they use all over. And it's a pretty strong visual cue for where to go on a bike. They aren't just trying to eliminate the car. They're working with car management when thinking about ways we can manage cars to make the road safer for pedestrians and cyclists and make traffic better for drivers. not just a single bike lane. It's not just one single route of bike lane. It's about facilitating the option to cycle from anywhere to everywhere. Thanks. Thanks. One of the things I thought was really interesting, my takeaway was, meeting politicians where they are. They're trying to find ways to make people work together. They work with what you got, in other words. And I think we constrain ourselves in those yeah, areas. The enemy of the yeah, you can't expect me to not drive when, like, the bus is full or there's no bike lane. What kind of events can we do to show that, yes, it's a mode of transportation, but it also is a way to connect with the community? They're not all that different from the challenges that we've had. They've just been looking at it for longer. create a child-friendly city, right? Because once you get these kids riding when they're young, they'll keep riding, they'll ride to university, they'll ride when they're older, and they hopefully will even teach their children how to ride, and that's how you get intergenerational change. You have to give them the alternative that has to be safe. You can't expect people to start riding their bike if it's really, really dangerous. With a roundabout, you only stop because there's somebody else that needs to go first, right? learned that it took a really long time to get where the Netherlands is now, what are the steps that we can sort of take to kind of like change and shift that culture? But I've learned that I still have so many people in the industry and opportunities and chances to benefit from travel and um, bike economy. One, two, three. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us. Hopefully the sound came through. Okay. Uh, good evening, council, staff, members of the public. My name is Matt Miller. I work with Ecology Action. Uh, I'm a program manager over there in our Moto Active Transportation team, and I helped organize the study visit here to the Netherlands. So I wanted to, for a couple minutes, kind of set the stage for why did we do this trip? Uh, who are we? What's the context of Ecology Action? Um, if you actually go back one more, or go back to the previous slide. Uh, so Ecology Action, for those of you who are not familiar, we're a 54-year-old nonprofit headquartered in downtown Santa Cruz. Uh, we do a lot of different kinds of work, but our mission is to advance equitable community climate solutions in high greenhouse gas emitting sectors. And for tonight, we're really going to be talking all about the transportation portion of that. Uh, work that you might be familiar with, walk and roll to school day, that's something Ecology Action has been running since the 90s for the last uh, few decades. Bike to work day, that's uh, one of our programs. We do a lot of, in our transportation work in particular, we do youth education and safety. We do a lot of adult and community-based work. We have a planning team where we do active transportation plans. Uh, so we kind of have a, a quite a mix of different offerings that we do as an organization. Okay, now we can go. So, and this has four advancements on this same slide, so I'll just give you a heads up. So, a couple of years ago, we were presented with an opportunity to host the Dutch Cycling Embassy here in Santa Cruz. 
Uh, we partner with Gazelle Bikes, which is a Dutch company. Their North American headquarters is here in Santa Cruz. And they were hosting a trade mission from the Netherlands here in Santa Cruz. And they reached out to us about organizing basically a bike summit for two days. So we got together a group of 35 or so people from across Santa Cruz County and Monterey Bay to look at how would it work? What could it look like for us to actually unlock multimodal mobility, biking, walking, transit, and cars? How could it all work together so that we're not so dominated in one particular area? As we'll touch on multiple times throughout tonight, the Netherlands was all in on cars up until about 50 years ago. And then the people and the government of the Netherlands came together and decided there has to be a better way. And what is that way? And the last 50 years has basically been a demonstration of a commitment to trying to figure that out. And today, the Netherlands has actually gotten to the point where they're like, we've got this pretty well sorted, and now we're going to actually share this knowledge with the rest of the world. And so they host workshops. They will uh, host you for a study visit. They have a range of things that they can offer to support other regions like Santa Cruz County to kind of help figure this out. So let's go to the next so this looks like it's a view of the night sky, but actually what we're looking at is a heat map of bicycle infrastructure. And that big, bright uh, top left, that is the Netherlands. That is all of their bike infrastructure. You can go one more. This might be a view you're slightly more familiar with. This is Google Maps with the bike layer turned on. All of the green that you see corresponds to bike lanes and bike paths. Let's go one more. And then this is Capitola. Similarly, looking at the green, obviously there's less, but that isn't to communicate like, look, we don't have anything going on. It's just uh, it's to look at what the potential could be, you know, with uh, bicycle oriented multimodal policies. All right, we can go forward. So who went on this trip? Uh, the final group was 30 delegates from across Santa Cruz County. We had a couple of bonus delegates, uh, one from the Transportation Agency of Monterey County and AMBAG. Uh, but the rest of our four local cities, the county, UC Santa Cruz, the RTC, uh, all attended and sent uh, one or multiple representatives on this trip. We'll keep going. We had polled all of the delegates uh, before the trip. What topics, what are areas that you really want to focus on while we're over there? And the list of seven that you see on the screen here represent what this group of 30 were interested in, in uncovering more about. Uh, and we'll be kind of touching on, and really, Kalosh will be kind of looking at a, a few of these. We won't, we don't have the time tonight to go into all the detail, but we'll just kind of give you a represent, uh, representation of it. Uh, we can follow up later after this evening. So, big picture headline: thirty of us from this region. We traveled to the Netherlands for a, a week-long study visit, and we really, really expanded our working knowledge about safety and livability and mobility. We have a lot more that this county now is aware of that we can you know, bring to bear in our local cities like Capitola. It's important to note that the Netherlands went from all in on cars like LA or New York or Bay Avenue with all the construction. And then they made a choice and what they've gotten to now is that 28% of all the trips that happen in that country are made by bike. And if you ask people, hey, do you really like biking? The answer isn't, yeah, they're just like, no, it's just kind of the easiest and best way to get around in a really similar way that we may relate to car driving. It's just like, no, it's just the best way to get around. Uh, but they have a comprehensive network to support that. And in the moment of right now, you know, we have congestion, we have traffic, we have climate change, we have e-bikes, name your, name your thing. We've got, uh, you know, a lot of work to do to increase walking and biking and transit and reduce GHG in the process. And it will require transformative and uh, important infrastructure changes. And this trip just gave the 30 of us uh, a much better view of how that could be done. And so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Kalosh to take through uh, some, some content, and then I'll be back here at the end. Thank you, Matt. Uh, first, I'd like to quickly thank Ecology Action and the staff behind the scenes that made this trip possible, uh, as well as the 20 other delegates, including Council Member or Vice Mayor Brooks. Uh, they, everyone put in so much energy during the course of our 72-hour whirlwind trip uh, with 10 to 12-hour days with meetings, presentations, tours, debriefs, and discussions. Uh, we, everything went seamlessly. We learned so much, saw so much, and nobody got lost. Um, the next few slides, I've, uh, we've pulled out a few key takeaways that we'd like to share with you tonight. 
the first here is uh, an, the looking at the, your community as a network. So this slide shows a simplified grid pattern of a community divided into blocks or neighborhoods uh, split up by roads, trails, or highways. These, this network allows us to traverse our town uh, within our town and into neighboring jurisdictions. Whether we know it or not, many of our roads have an existing hierarchy from slower residential streets to up to collectors and major arterials like 41st, increasing in speed and volume up to, uh, up to as large as Highway 1. This hierarchical approach allows us to make decisions about how we make use and build out this public right of way. Questions we can think about are, do we want to maximize throughput? Do we want to keep speed slow? Do we want on-street bike parking, car parking, green bike lanes, bus routes, or sidewalks? Some of these are compatible with one another with proper design, such as elevated sidewalks along roadways, but there are also times when they don't work together. For example, nobody has their front door on 41st Avenue, and there's no buses going down Riverview. To help further this topic, oh, next slide, please. To help further this topic of thinking about the network, I've brought in a couple slides from our general plan, which shows our neighborhoods on the left, and then our mixed use and commercial districts on the right. And so I think what we want to do is ask ourselves, which neighborhoods, businesses, destinations do you live or frequently visit, and what facilities are there? How easy is it for you to get between these areas by bike, foot, or by car? And what, could we, what, what is currently working well, and then what could we do to improve the connectivity between these regions? An interesting example that we learned on the trip that you may have grabbed in the video was that the Dutch were able to take large, dense community districts and eliminate uh, cars from being able to drive through them. They had parking lots on the perimeter and made the entire walking areas big promenades for sitting and eating and shopping. And, you know, initially we were wondering how do they make this happen with, you know, such large businesses being able to take regular deliveries? What do they do about emergency services? And they have this neat opportunity to put in bollards that are uh, accessible for those services so they can get through and there's no hiccup to the businesses, but you're able to make that a very safe area for, for, for people. Uh, while these models may not ex work exactly here, this challenge us to think about what we could do. We already have familiar with the success of turn restrictions and speed tables to improve the safety in our local neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Furthering the topic of the network is focusing on the intersections. Uh, what do we do when those different uh, road types come and meet one another, and how do you improve and, and kind of uh, make those areas safe for the, all the users? Um, these areas are known worldwide to be the highest areas for incidents for traffic collisions, both with pedestrians, bicycles, and vehicles. So throughout Santa Cruz County, we often see pedestrian and bikes facilities either taper or fall out in some of our intersections. In Holland, they've made a very concerted effort to provide dedicated space for all forms of transportation as you enter and work your way through intersections. And so what we have here, a picture on the top is uh, Wharf Road and, and Clare Street. So that was kind of one of our latest and greatest of improving visibility for all modes of transportation. And I think the feedback we've been given is that this has been a, a you know, significant improvement for all user types in that intersection. And then below that is a roundabout. So I think touching on what Vice Mayor Brooks said is that you, know, you, you try and you exercise different ideas and sometimes you find a good version and then sometimes they, you end up having to redo it. And, and come up with a better, but you, as long as you keep trying and working towards that progress, I think that's the mantra that they were impressed upon us when we were um, taking all those presentations from the, from the Dutch uh, community there. I'd like to advance one more slide and take a minute to focus on school zones. So given that we do have two school zones in the city of Capitol with New Brighton Middle School and then the preschool at Jade Street, um, you know, we wanna look at what the what's the intent of the roads that you have in those areas? And so one other mantra that they, they impress upon us is that you want to design your roads for the behavior that you want. And so what we have here on the right are two photos. One is the a photo of New Brighton Middle School at pickup time, and then a school in the Netherlands at pickup time as well. This is right before the bell rang for both of those schools. Um, I think you can imagine what that 
both look like as, as soon as you have kids spilling out into those streets. Uh, what the Dutch have done over time is identified the, the benefit of uh, reducing the ability to have cars in that immediate 500 foot or, you know, depending on the neighborhood, what's the best fit for it. But trying to reduce the ability for cars to be as prevalent in those zones, knowing that you have that kind of more vulnerable community of children, often um, in, a, in high numbers and high densities in these areas. And so instead of driving right to the school, they, they encourage pick up and drop off zones that are a little bit further out to allow walking and biking more safely in that immediate area around the schools. And I think I'd like to take a few more minutes too and show the, um, or just come start talking about, you know, the question of, of why, like why should we entertain these types of changes? Uh, there are, I think, two main user groups that I think are a good focus for us to think about when thinking about these is both our, 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 our children and our seniors. Um, I don't know if it's been the experience for all of you in your neighborhoods over the last five or so years, but I've definitely noticed a big uptake in the use of e-bikes in both of those user groups, the children and the seniors. And I think it's great. It's getting people out on their bike. They're exploring our neighborhoods. Um, and I think the question we want to think about is, what can we do to make that a safer experience to be continued to be used? Because those, you know, I think those user groups are only going to intensify over time. And I think our task is to try to make that the most safe and easy way for them to also um, enjoy our community. Uh, one other uh, question that the Dutch often provided us to think about is to ask yourself, would you send you know, a loved one, I guess, in, in, to, to walk or ride down you know, X, Y street? And if the answer was no, what would you want to change to make that answer a yes? And I think in our community, thinking about the different neighborhoods and the business centers, I think we could ask ourselves the same things. I think some of our neighborhoods are easy to get between and safe to feel like you can get between, and others might have gaps in the system that we might be able to make or address. Uh, beyond the safety and uh, the communities, more walking and biking also ends up with people with improved mental and physical health and well-being. I know for a personal example, I, I definitely feel better when I walk into the office after I've ridden to work rather than when I've driven to work. Um, and then uh, let's ad advance one more slide. And then another big question as to, to answer the question of why is, is the reason why is you end up with the safest streets in the world. And that's what the Netherlands has done with this concerted effort over time. The bar graphs are kind of hard to read, but on the left is the United States. Um, immediately next to that is the Netherlands. And then the other three countries are those that have had the opportunity to be and model some of the work that's been achieved in the Netherlands. And so they, they are, they're trailing fairly close to the Netherlands. And I think this represents an opportunity for where we can work towards and strive for safer streets for, for all user groups. I believe Santa Cruz County has a unique character as being kind of a small town USA with huge metro metro metropolitan areas around us. And so I think we have an opportunity to set an example. On to the next slide, please. I think the big takeaways we wanted to kind of focus on here is that we want to make our community safer and more user friendly for all of our residents and visitors. I think this is a shared goal that we can all get behind. And in working towards that goal, the result will be more, a more livable community that attracts and boosts economic development and quality of life. The fact that all of our jurisdictions, as Matt explained, went and shared in this experience has already resulted in cross collaboration between our different jurisdictions. And I'm excited to see how we can collectively guide our path and then see how this story plays out. For the next steps, I'd like to hand this back to Matt. Yeah. Thank you, Kailash. So obviously that was really just the very beginning, right? That, that was just the tip of the iceberg. So uh, after, after this evening, uh, public work staff and uh, myself and members of my team would like to meet with uh, members of council just to be able to talk in a little more detail, a uh, larger format about where some of these uh, lessons that we learned could be applied in a local context. I think there's a lot of really good material that we can look at together. And then Ecology Action is going to be from here, uh, continuing to organize this cohort that we formed for this study visit. Uh, we weren't sure if it was just gonna be a visit and then everyone goes back to their jobs and we say thanks and good luck out there. And what became clear when we got back together is that the collaboration and the cohort that we built this cross county jurisdiction uh, collaboration 
feels really supportive and it feels like the kind of energy and knowledge sharing and resource and capacity building uh, that this county can all really benefit from, especially, uh, you know, smaller jurisdictions like Capitola and Scotts Valley. So we're going to be reconvening the delegation in December uh, for a, a meeting to look at, you know, what have we done since we got back? What are uh, we thinking about for 2025? Uh, what can we each share with each other, uh, do some design review and really just kind of keep and elevate the, the work the being done across the county and we'll help organize and keep that momentum moving forward. And of course, because we've got our delegates here from Capitola, you'll be able to kind of stay apprised of what's going on and we'd be happy to come back at any time and, and provide updates too. But for now, thank you for the time and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you, Matt. And, um, you know, and what I'll just add in, in closing is that we have the opportunity as council members to make this a priority in our goals in our next session or in our planning session. Um, and I've, I've reached out and Matt and I have talked about like, well, this kind of stuff takes money and paint costs money and looking at different opportunities for us to seek funding in order to get some of these projects done. My, my hope is to see the front of New Brighton get, you know, become a safer place for our students and our residents to get through, as well as the whole Bay Avenue corridor with a consistent bike lane that's wider, that's safer for um, e-bikes and, and can slow our cars down. So, you know, I appreciate you meeting with council um, in the future here and, and council um, making this a priority for, for our community. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Yvette. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> This is a pretty open-ended question, but yeah. I think during the presentation we saw a lot of very inspiring um, systems for bicycles and pedestrians. And I'm wondering if either of you took away any innovative um, insight into how to actually accomplish that. From you know, like what what were the strategies that they used to go from car centric to bicycle and pedestrian centric? Yeah, I mean there is there is quite literally a book on it. So they they. <laughs> tried and failed a few times. When, when they started this work in the late 70s, they, they came out with a few early bike plans that flopped. And they went back to the drawing board. And on their third try, they developed a really successful bike plan in the town of Delft, which we visited on a study visit. It's 100,000 people. It's a university town. And one of the keys to their success was getting 4,700 households providing commentary on the bike plan. But all of the lessons that they got out of those first couple of years, they put together into what they call the Crow Manual, which is basically the book on how to do this uh, across the Netherlands. And it's been iterated and updated since the early 80s and really provides down to incredibly granular detail, like what kind of gutter pans do you want, as well as like community engagement. Uh, it provides kind of a, a blueprint for that. But to also kind of give you something more substantive in the moment, you know, I think a few of the things that we learned was we're going to get it wrong. We're going to mess up. But the biggest thing that they did is that they kept at it. They didn't just say, this is too hard and complicated. Sorry. Like we're just going to, you know, go with the status quo. Um, I think a couple things that we, I felt we felt like we're low, low hanging fruit is really just appreciating the, the speed of travel and the speed of traffic on our roads. And that speed is the primary feeling that creates feelings of unsafe or unsafety on the roadway. If you're on a neighbor, you can just think of like quiet neighborhood roads in Capitola where there are cars and people walking and biking, but if the speeds are low enough, it doesn't necessarily feel unsafe. It feels like you can negotiate, make eye contact, use hand signals. But when you get out to bigger roads and the speeds pick up and the volumes pick up, that's when people are like, no way, I don't want to be out there. You know, you have e-bikes now in the mix going faster speeds. So I think the Netherlands have really looked hard at how do you address speed on all your different types of roads and then accommodate that. So in the neighborhood setting, you, I mean, some of it's just built in like Riverview. You just can't go fast on that road no matter what you do, right? It's narrow. On other roads, there's, they put physical se separation. So like on 41st Avenue, that's an example. In the Netherlands, that road would have physical separation between cars and bikes just by virtue of how fast cars are going. And that's just a, that they do that across the board. And so that, I think, appreciation of speed 
um, results in really clear road types and they do that everywhere. And then as soon as it feels comfortable, people start walking and biking and then it kind of creates its own feedback loop. And there's like about 5,000 other things to say, but that just kind of gives you a sense. And again, we'd love to follow up and, you know, have a little more time to talk through all this. And Council Member Peterson, Kalosh and I talked a lot about this, about just the outreach and the importance of education around this. Mm -hmm. We can't just do it. Right. Um, and that's what we heard loud and clear from the representatives there and the, the folks that actually did the work. They have a, they created an entire campaign. Like you turn the TV on and there are commercials about safe biking there. I mean, and this is their life. This is everyday lifestyle for them. And they still continue that message. The schools have the educational component. College Action does this already with educating students on, on safe biking. Um, but then it's the entire community learning about this and having buy-in and input. Um, because if we're going to make any changes to a community like Cliffwood Heights, where we live, you know, we need the community to, to understand and buy into that in, in that message. So Yeah. And I think really important to, the, uh, to our understanding, and I think kind of a, an epiphany that we had on the trip was their goal isn't to go get more people walking and biking. Their goal is to create safe, highly mobile, attractive, livable places where it's logical that you walk or bike, not where it's like I might get hurt or my kid might get hurt if they go out there. So the result is they invest in a, in a kind of a holistic approach where walking and biking is just one of the tools, but they're not just out there trying to get the number of bikes up. They're trying to create livable, safe places. And I, th and I think that was a, a definitely a reorientation for us while we were over there. But you can, you can see it bear out everywhere. You've got all stripes, all ages, all abilities that are out using the roads. I do have a question for any of you. Um, we've talked about e-bikes forever now. So how, what was, what was it like there? Was e-bikes the main choice or were people using regular bikes or? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, they, just to kind of give you a sense of scale in the Netherlands, there's 18 million people who live there and there's like 1.3 bikes per person in that country. There's a lot and they've been at it for decades. So, E-bikes are gaining traction and are far more popular, and I think they're outpacing in terms of sales, but they still only represent less than 20% of the bikes that were out there. And they are absolutely experiencing a lot of the issues that we are in the sense that they built infrastructure around sort of a paradigm of speed and size, and now there's this new element that doesn't really fit in the road, but also doesn't really fit in the bike lane. So they're they're grappling with this too, and they're even thinking like, do we need e-bike specific infrastructure that's somewhere in between? For what it's worth, we kind of have the benefit of like, we still have a lot of bike facilities to build to begin with. So how can we think about maybe setting standards that accommodate what we know is probably going to continue, which are, you know, e-bikes are popular with all ages and abilities. Yeah. So they're grappling with it. Nobody's figured it out yet. Yeah. I'd like to find out how we can get this philosophy of, of bikes versus um, we having this Bill, um, Bay Avenue Hill Street problem because of people can't get through the intersection fast enough. But it is safer for bicyclists right now if they're following the law. Like you, you said there was problems and it was dangerous. That's only because people aren't following the law. So how do we get that philosophy to our motorists um, so that we can have more places where bikes are safer and pedestrians? Yeah, that's a... That's another really great point. The, our, our current transportation system is predicated on perfect human behavior. If everybody does everything right and stops and isn't distracted, we're going to be fine. All they then we're, uh, we're human, right? We, do, we make mistakes. We're distracted. We're having a hard time. We're running late for something. So the Dutch approach is that people are going to make mistakes. So you build that mistakes will happen into your environment and you create a more forgiving landscape. You know, so... For example, they're, they're on a countrywide campaign to remove traffic lights and replace them with roundabouts because if you decide you're going to ignore the stop sign, you can drive through an intersection and nothing will stop you and you might hit somebody else. That's here. In a roundabout setting, if you decide to keep going, you're going to hit the middle of the roundabout. Right? You have to slow down. You have to make a turn in and out. And so there's a lot of psychology built into 
how do we, what kind of design will help the behavior that we're after, which is ultimately safety, right? What we care about is getting from Highway 1 to their house, and they don't worry about anything else. Right. So we have to have, have roads designed that encourages the behavior that we want, because if, it, if it's just a sign, people will, in many cases, ignore the sign. Yeah. Good point, though. I think my question was... Um, much in alignment with council member Clark about kind of the psychology of, of these changes. Um, and I don't know who this question's for or if we even have an answer right now, but the idea of designing, designing for the behavior you want. And I think as mentioned, we could, that's what we were hoping for with the Bay Hill. And there was a lot of anger, right? We have a very fast culture. If we're not going fast, it's bad. And so there's a lot of frustration and anger around that. And I think we're also starting to see that in development, both business and residential, in terms of parking, right? Mm -hmm. People get really upset when there's not enough parking. But if we're trying to change behavior to have not so much of a car-centric, um, you know, everything focused around cars, yeah. how do we change the psychology in a way that every time we build something that doesn't have as much parking as people think it should have, that there's not kind of a an outcry over it? rather that there's a shift towards, well, maybe we need to be looking at other things aside from car-centric behavior. So I don't know if there's a good answer for that tonight. I don't know if maybe you could solve that problem for us, but um, just something. Actually, we figured it all out. We have the whole plan. Yeah, we're, right. yeah, we're ready to go. Yeah, we've we got it all. We all the answers. <laughs> yeah. hey, Matt, if you want to just breathe, talk about how people still own cars there, you know, and so if you want to. Yeah, it, we... You know, we all went into this trip with our own notions of what we were going to learn. And we thought, oh, it's just going to be a, a bike-oriented trip. And what we really learned is that they have an integrated multimodal plan. And they actually love driving. They love their cars over there. So much so that it's actually a pretty pleasant place to do it. And it really comes down to prioritization of roads. Like, this is a car road. We are going to make it awesome for driving. This is a bike road. We are going to make it great for biking. A lot of times what we do, and in the case of Capitola, our bike and our car network are kind of right over the top of each other. We're trying to fit it all in the same place. And so there's congestion, there's high speed, there's uh, difficulties with safety. So we have to kind of disentangle it and say like, I don't know, you know, Riverview is a good example. It's a, it's a quieter road. That's a far more conducive road for walking and biking traffic. But to your uh, question, Mayor Brown, I think that as you're any of these policies that you think about a new development with you know maximum parking versus minimum parking right has to be kind of done in an integrated way so you can't just do it in a vacuum and just say that new development has no parking and good luck out there you really kind of have to look at it in a suite of policies for how do you improve the walkability and bikeability and amenities around that development so that car dependence is almost eliminated from the equation, right? And when you get like truly affordable, equitable uh, transportation systems, people have, you know, equal opportunity and they're not left out if they don't have a car, right? So it's, it's kind of thinking about it in a holistic model. You know, the new development on 41st Avenue and Soquel, that's on a, a transit network. There's a grocery store up across the street. You know, it's close to a hospital. That's an example of something that's kind of densified and you don't need as much car capacity there. And we're also geographically constrained. So if it's really just a geometry issue. If we keep building around the car, we're gonna you know, continue to sprawl. So the Dutch have really worked on densification and, and having walkable, bikeable districts where you really can live a high quality life without having a car there. But it's complicated and there's not a straightforward answer. It's very contextual. We'll keep working on it. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions before we go to public comment? All right. Thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, it. Thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. Uh, any public comment on this item? <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. I had a friend who lived in the Netherlands for a while, and what she stressed a number of times was the separation of the bicycle areas from the cars. That's absolutely critical. I also think they probably have a different economic structure that enabled them to do this that 
we would have more difficulty with. I think of this documentary you're talking about, Kristen, a car-centric society. Boy, is that sure. I have a documentary called Taken for a Ride that shows how <clears throat> in the 19, about the 1940s or earlier, the Goodyear Tires General Motors conspired, they got a slap on the wrist for it later, to buy up good transportation systems, public transportation across the U.S. and rip it out and make everyone dependent on the cars and they could sell their cars because the trolleys used to run every few minutes. They were inexpensive, so there's an economic structure here of why we are so car-centric. Eco I, so I have some questions that was very fascinating, interesting. We can definitely learn from other countries. And um, e-bikes, I think there have been discussions here of the many problems with e-bikes, uh, including the electricity from them. And there's problems with, I don't know if they're GPS or once. I took my detection meter microwave radiation to an e-bike, and it went way up because they're emitting microwave radiation, which isn't safe. And here's a quote from Barry Trower, Royal Navy microwave weapons researcher, and um, it was his expertise in England. To my knowledge, microwave or radio wave sickness was first reported in August 1932, with the symptoms of severe tiredness, fatigue, fitful sleep, headaches, intolerability, and high susceptibility to infection. The paradox, of course, is how microwave radiation can be used as a weapon to cause impairment, illness, and death and at the same time be used as a communications instrument. So my question is, this was sometimes they say smart cities. What is being used in terms of wireless microwave technology, which is a hazard and not ecological? Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula Bradley. I live over by 41st in Capitola Road, and I ride all over the county and many other places and comment on bike usage and infrastructure. In fact, I'm the city of Capitola's representative on the Bicycle Advisory Committee to review projects. Um, the RTC is reviewing the Regional Transportation Commission, so I'll continue to do that. But I, I I see a lot of frustration. I'm out riding on the roads all over adjacent counties too. Just returned from two bicycle tours in France this summer. Um, I think we're going through a lot of growing pains. We're seeing this increase in bicycle usage, e-bikes. And just keep in mind, as frustrating as it might be, even myself, I see people going the wrong way down the road and the sidewalk and, you know, we need a lot of education, and the more people that are walking and riding bikes, including the kids and the kids on the e-bikes, that means there's less vehicle trips, which is healthier for our environment, you know, less pollution, less need for fossil fuel, healthier lifestyle, but we need a lot of education for drivers and cyclists and you know, I'm sure pedestrians have frustrations too with the e-bikes on the sidewalks, which is a big problem. But I also witnessed uh, traveling in Amsterdam and Netherlands, and it's quite amazing to get to go to these other countries where they have the infrastructure that we wish that we had here. But I also saw on the city streets of Amsterdam, pedestrians and cyclists and motor scooters sharing a 10 foot wide sidewalk with basically a stripe down the middle with peds on one side and bikes on the other. And 
when you first arrive there, you're just like, you know, what is this? This is insane. But I talked to the person that was leading the tour I was on, and I asked about collisions with bikes and peds, and and he said, surprisingly, there were very few. So, you know, people can learn to get along. It, it's, you know, it's different. We have to get used to it. But people can share the streets. And a lot of the frustration is just sharing the space that we have. And, you know, I think we just keep prioritizing getting there. Thank you. Hi, welcome back. Thank you. I just want to remind people that there are a lot of handicapped people, and a bike doesn't work for me, <laughs> as you can obviously figure out. But sometimes the paths work, sometimes they don't, and I can't go as far as a bike can go. You can go 100 miles on a bike. I can barely go a mile. So eliminating cars altogether isn't really well for some handicapped people. People who can walk who are blind and stuff. The rail trails are exciting to some of our blind people because they feel, will feel safer on that. But also keep in mind that we can't totally eliminate the cars because I would die without my car because I couldn't go here or there. I certainly couldn't go to the store and pick up groceries for six people, which is what I do. So keep that in mind. But it sounds like a, a wonderful plan. It sounds like a lot of work to convince people that they need to do this. And if I can help with something, I'll be more than welcome to, to do that. I am on the, if I can say it, Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee of the Regional Transportation Commission. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> so you can find me there. Thank you. Thank you. I have just a, co a couple of quick comments. Uh, one, one I think you know, but one I haven't heard in any place, which is, you know, the state has mandated in 2030s, I don't remember the exact year, that you'll only be able to buy an electric vehicle. So it seems to me that one thing I haven't heard about any of the e-bikes is obviously, as the gentleman was just talking about, was the speed issue and so on and so forth. So is there any way to, whether we start it, the state looks at it or whatever, somehow throttle the e-bikes so they can have a maximum speed? Because then effectively, if you can't go any faster than somebody that's pedaling a bike, you get all the conveniences of an e-bike, but guess what? Now you have that, that speed conduciality and, and, uh, and you can mix the two groups pretty easily. The second thing I think that the, the, the study and the trip basically illustrates, and we kind of all know it anyway, you know, let's get real. Capitola is like a European village. Okay, and that's, and that's our mandate. But the one, one place that's different, and for those of you that have been to Europe, and, and fortunately been, I've been to the Netherlands three or four times and a couple of times I've been over to Italy, is we know that they have a great mix of the, the architecture of a first level business and then the uh, apartments and the living above it and stuff like that. So I just think as we move forward, because that would, would accommodate the handicap, that would accommodate the, the movement around the city, because if I only have to go, you know, three or four blocks to basically the grocery store or the 7-Eleven to pick something up, as opposed to jumping in the car and go to Safeway or Nob Hill or whatever, then obviously I'm gonna do that, and it, it adds to that whole conduciality. So I think we, I would recommend we kind of look at that as one of our overall philosophies of, along with the transportation, try and look at how does that mix with the housing and the business requirements that we're gonna be putting on people coming and building into, into Capitola. Thank you. Hi, welcome back. Hi, um, I am really excited about all this discussion and the collaboration across the whole county. Um, I live on the 41st corridor we live close to the mall and Brown's Ranch, and we often bike to Brown's Ranch. And I've alluded to this before, we've had many close calls on Capitol Road, and there are no bike lanes on Claire's. I feel like there should be a prioritization in terms of connecting our communities, making sure we have safe bike lanes where, where residents can feel safe using them. And Claire Street is an obvious one. 
Um, another obvious road I'd like to see prioritized uh, with the segment 10 of the rail trail that connects pretty much Jay Street to north of the county. Um, we will, at that terminus, we'll need a connection from that part of Jade Street Park or 42nd or 47th to the the Capitola Library. There's no good bike lanes to um, Rispin Park with the bridge that connects the west side of um, Capitola to the east side of Capitola through the, the bridge there. So that area as well, I, I feel, should be a prioritization for the city. Um, but this is all very, very exciting. I'd like to see more safe roads, safe bike lanes where people can walk and um, be, a, be truly a part of the community with safe community spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Yes. Yeah, take your time. Uh, I want to see the Navy Pool. I'm Richard McAdam. Because of the presentation, I'd like to talk to you a little different area than Capitola. But in Mexico, I think there's a connection between what could be where you create jobs for our young people because I get off the bus and boy, now that's a long walk when you get to the AVA. I think we could make a connection between ecology action and a model here in Capitola because many people would love to get a kid a job. And I remember the things they had in Mexico, the kids peddled. Well, think about possibilities. So not, don't need three minutes. I just want to say, I wish my city of Santa Cruz would have what I experienced here on this agenda item. And I wasn't here for this one, but if we're going to focus on possibilities, then please invite the probation department to get this community involved because at the county where we had all that publicity on the cigarettes and all the rest, you should have seen the lines, I've got it on my, my camera, they want the community when they're making these big decisions of what they're doing with the kids. So we all do what we do. And I didn't mean the, no, I don't need the mic, but it's nice to be with some friends. And so I happen to know that good ideas take the people that have the management we lost maybe Watsonville's to Salinas, but look what you got still. So appreciate what we might do. Think about jobs and what we can do for the young people. With us elders, I'd sure hire a kid rather than walking three blocks from a bus stop, at least on Soquel. They do come to buses every 15 minutes. I hope that spoke to you and it would be a Thank you. Any further comment on this item? Okay, seeing none, we will bring it back to council. Uh, there is no action on this item. It is just a presentation. Uh, we are going on to two hours, so we will take a quick three, four minute break for anyone who needs to stretch their legs, get some air, check the score of the game, and we will return momentarily.
All right, everyone, if we could take our seats, we're going to go ahead and resume the meeting. And we're back. We are on item 8B, uh, and this item is an RFQ for the 41st Avenue corridor plan. And I'll turn it over to Katie. Thank you, Mayor Brown and Council. Uh, tonight before you is an RFQ, a request for qualifications for the, a future 41st Avenue corridor plan. Next slide, please. Um, our recommended action tonight is that the City Council authorize staff to publish a RFQ um, for a future corridor plan. Next slide. Some background here. Um, over the years, Capitol has done multiple economic development studies. Uh, during our most recent budget hearing, $75,000 was put to the side to uh, towards economic development on our 41st Avenue corridor. Um, in deciding what to utilize those funds for, we went back, looked at some of the economic development studies that have already been done for the 41st Avenue corridor. There was one done in 2009. Um, and then again, an, a newer study in 2011 during the general plan update. And both had a, repeated um, elements of for, to, um, for economic growth and redevelopment, really looking at our land use, our, um, our urban design within that area, better definition of place, traffic, circulation, creating a place that people really want to be and experience. Next slide, please. Uh, many of the items have been completed from those studies that were related that you can implement within your zoning code and your regulations. So um, following the 2009 and 2011 studies, our uh, regional commercial along 41st Avenue was modified to allow mixed use, both vertical and horizontal mixed use. So um, commercial on the first floor with housing above, or as long as it's on the same lot, a mix of commercial and residential within the same property, but not, horizontal is when it doesn't have to be first story commercial, but they can be side by side. Uh, we reduce parking requirements along um, within our regional commercial areas. We've decreased the requirements for when a, a conditional use permit is needed for new businesses to come in um, for low impact commercial. We've also created an incentivized section of our code in which you, a developer can get increased height or floor area ratio, which um, is something that's on our mall site and around uh, the Capitola Road and 41st Avenue intersection. We've updated our sign code to make it easier to get administrative permits for new businesses. We've uh, raised the threshold for when a conditional use permit is required by the Planning Commission to really incentivize businesses coming into the district. And we've also changed our criteria um, to be more objective and quantifiable. Um, and those are changes that we have made. Next slide, please. In going through these studies, some of the changes that we have not made, um, and primarily due to like resources, funding, because these are more expensive um, obligations by the city, but uh, working towards a unified design theme and branding for the 41st Avenue corridor. Um, improving our infrastructure to attract retailers, so our infrastructure being the streets, uh, creating complete streets to connect the corridor to the neighboring um, neighborhoods, which was a focus of some of the prior discussion, um, enhancing those pedestrian and bicycle access points, uh, the focus on the Metro Transit Center, that's something that's a focus within our uh, general plan. And then looking at our urban amenities to bring in more mixed use and residential projects and our facilities, and then just uh, focusing more on some of the short-term projects that are easier to implement, such as wayfinding, landscaping, and public spaces, and uh, just placemaking in terms of a vibrant mixed use corridor in the future. So next slide. Um, more recently, we've adopted our housing element in August. And the 41st Avenue and the Capitola Mall is, is one of the um, major development projected areas for future housing in Capitola. So um, we have a need for higher density residential and really focusing in on that corridor and transforming it into a place that not only people shop, but in a place that they want to be and raise their families 
and uh, be able to get around safely as well as having a more um, pleasant experience as a pedestrian or on a bicycle. Next slide, please. So for this, what we're proposing to um, moving forward is to start a new planning effort to, towards a corridor plan for the 41st Avenue and to put out a request for qualifications to guide future reinvestment into the 41st Avenue. Within a request for qualifications, um, you, you place your goals um, and purposes out there to, the, to contractors um, in which they can produce um, a plan to move forward and how we could implement this strategy. So typically within an RFP, we, the city creates a very defined scope in which the when um, consultants respond to the scope, they give all the details of exactly how it fits within the city scope. This is a different approach in which you're reaching out to planning professionals and asking them what is the best approach for creating a corridor plan within our 41st Avenue corridor. Next slide. Um, so in, in identifying what our goals would be, it would be to create um, a new plan in which multi the streets are multimodal streets for pedestrians, bicycles, cars, public transit, um, looking at opportunities for new green spaces along 41st Avenue. The city owns the right of way, but really looking at opportunities of whether or not there's the ability to create new green spaces. Um, also looking at placemaking and branding through public art, lighting, landscaping, signs, street furniture, and looking at safety enhancements as we discussed it during the last presentation. And then also in putting this all together, thinking about the future planning along 41st Avenue and how it would be incorporated. Next slide. Um, so I'm gonna walk through an example of a corridor plan that really utilizes planning principles as well as transportation principles. So this is re-envision West Arden Arcade and it was a, um, an effort um, in the Sacramento area for uh, creating a new corridor study. So this is an example of one of their streets and it kind of has similar characteristics to our 41st Avenue and mall site. Next slide, please. Sorry, when they uh, did their public outreach, there were three main goals that came out of that in really trying to create vibrant, family-friendly neighborhoods with, with a strong identity, uh, creating accessibility and connections for people for walking, rolling, biking, and within public transit, and then also uh, thriving local businesses. So keeping your businesses that you have thriving as well as attracting new businesses to the area. Next slide, please. Um, this is also an example from that study. So on the left, you're seeing what their typical street looked like prior to the study, and then the suggestion of really separating the cars from the bicycles, bringing in more landscaping and trees to create a better um, experience and a more green experience for the end user. Next slide, please. Um, and also in there is design principles. So um, looking at pedestrian scale lighting, um, furniture along the street, public furniture such as benches, um, shade structures, and then also creating community spaces within larger blocks. So how you break down a block. Um, back in 2019 when we had a mall redevelopment project and they created their new main street going through the mall and they had park areas, it really changed the whole dynamic of what we think of as the Capitola Mall today and what it could be in the future. So just identifying where those, how we could um, have these spaces within the future. Next slide. Um, and then this image is um, a block by block image showing how you can really improve these areas. And it's uh, not only through bike lanes um, and expanding sidewalks, but really looking at your, the natural landscape and bringing in more trees, um, making it a cooler environment, uh, really thinking about your areas that you have too much parking and creating more public spaces where people can gather. Um, so this is just one example that would could be implemented within a future corridor plan. Next slide. Um, so the timeline, we're, um, if authorized tonight, we would publish the RFQ in October um, and then ask for submissions in February of 2025. So 
giving people time to really put together that um, the scope and how they would approach this project. And next slide, please. And then the funding for this, originally there was uh, 75,000 that was allocated through our, um, uh, through the general plan um, update fund. And then we also uh, received extra money through AMBAG. Originally they had cut back our REAP 2.0 grant by 50% and then it ended up the cut was only about 10%, so we have about $35,000 there to add to this as well. So the total is 110,000. I think there was an error in the staff report, so correcting that. I, um, but, so our recommendation tonight, go to the next slide, is to authorize staff to publish the RFQ for a 41st Avenue corridor plan. So with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Questions? It's super exciting to see this coming along. Um, one of the things I have concern about, and I've heard some rumors about it, uh, the disconnect but maybe between the city and some of the owners of the mall and the mall property. Hopefully we're working hand in hand with them as we're moving forward on this. We have a good dialogue with them so that we don't have one idea and then they have another idea so that we can streamline it all. Hopefully that's something the staff's been working on. Yes, so we would initially uh, reach out to a lot of the different property owners along 41st Avenue corridor, but as well as Merlon Geyer at the mall to discuss the future of growth on 41st Avenue and um, what their desires are as business owners and property owners. Does the REAP grant expire? It does. We would have to complete the work tied that's in conjunction with the REAP grant by September of next year. So the initial billing could come out of the REAP grant to make sure we spend that money first. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Katie, for all the great work you're doing on this. It's really exciting. Um, I had a question based on um, correspondence we received from <clears throat> City Council candidate Melinda Orbach um, proposing a specific plan. Could you talk a little bit about the difference between a specific plan and the recommended action of the RFQ? Yes. Um, so a specific plan is what we're looking at tonight is a corridor plan, and it really looks at the area within our right of way and those connections to the right of way. And along the 41st Avenue corridor, we really don't own much land other than the 40, you know, within our street area. Um, a specific plan is more of a land use development tool that um, you define a specific area and then you do a planning study within that area. So really looking at existing conditions and then the specific plan, you, you work um, with with the public to help to find like what the future of that area should be and what the vision is with, for the community in that area. And then um, really redefining your zoning in that area to effectuate the specificity of a plan for the future. So you could have like different height limits along different streets. Um, it's really a, it's almost like a, an additional zoning layer with a specific plan because you're, um, they're, and another difference is a specific plan where um, is typically more expensive and it's also uh, a cost added cost with an EIR that accompanies it for uh, the CEQA analysis. So where this study is about 100,000, a specific plan, you'd be looking at close to a million. And if we were to do a specific plan in the future, would that be reproducing efforts and expenses? we did this first in a specific plan after would the specific plan encompass a lot of the same work that we're doing um, in this project we're talking about today. So the specific plan as uh, community director Hurley mentioned really focuses on the private property and developing sort of what the plan is for the private property. You do look at the infrastructure around it. This is really kind of coming up with a blueprint for the streets. Yeah, for our right of way. I think you saw in the presentation how there's been a lot of different steps we've taken kind of on the regulatory side, like trying to change the zoning, to help make it easier for people to use properties, incentivize people to come in. This is 
there's sort of another way at kind of economic development. Um, a good example of that that we're all familiar with is Lower 41st in the county, where they went in and they really rebuilt the infrastructure. And then over the next decade, you saw kind of the redevelopment infill and come back in. So this, this the goal is to identify kind of in the three major blocks, if you will, from Claire's to the freeway and then in front of the mall and then maybe Cap Road south to the city limits, kind of what does our idealized street look like? You know, taking some of the lessons learned from the Netherlands trip, you know, how, how do you divvy up the space to make sure that it, moves people effectively because we're going to have traffic we're going to have a lot of cars but it also moves other types of users through that space as well and maybe accomplishes some of those other goals helps with branding helps with place making so it's kind of they're sort of separate and they can definitely work in conjunction um but i wouldn't say it's a repetition by any means the other item i'd add is it's really with this blueprint it creates a tool that we can go after more grant money um and try to effectuate the change within the street and also planning grants um, for future, just looking at the placemaking standards. Um, so it's really like that first step so that we can then apply for more grant funds in the future and see that incremental change of 41st Avenue over time. Great, thank you. Thank you, Katie, for the, the presentation. Um, my question is in regards to whether we have all of the information and data um, and studies collection from um, that would help the potential consultant really with this blueprint. And so I'm speaking to, you know, we have a strategic plan out there. Um, we're collecting information from the community and what they'd like to see on the corridor. Um, we have the annexation study taking place. And so I, I'm just concerned, and I think Council Member Morgan brings up a good point about the the um, the grant funding. My question to you is: It's feeling. Does this feel like the consultant would have all the information now, or is it? Would it make sense to push this out a little bit longer until all of the information is collected? Because perhaps this consultant needs to look at the all of Forty First Avenue. You know, not just those three blocks. It could potentially be more. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's a timeline issue, and that this could wait until all the information is there for the consultant. I think you make a really good point in that um, we're, we are right now going through a strategic planning process, which the public will be identifying a vision for the future of the whole city. Uh, within the actual corridor plan, it's really focused on this corridor. So I, I think you could run them simultaneously, but I could see a benefit from um, making sure to get all that the data points and understanding the overarching goals within the strategic plan. So uh, I do think a lot of valuable information will be coming out of that. Um, but I, I do think you could, this is going to be really engaging with the property owners along uh, 41st Avenue and the neighbors, neighborhoods around it. So um, again, it would be a lot of public outreach, but. Um, is it in the RF? Q to look at the entire 41st, that was really my pointed question about the, we're looking at potentially having all of that or, you know, absor absolving that into the community. And so I'm just curious whether that's built into the RFQ. You're referring to the annexation yeah. study, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it would only be to our current city boundary. And so right now we have the potential, you know, we're looking at that. And so mm -hmm. my, my question is more specific to that, whether doing this with only three blocks and for $110,000 now, and then perhaps we need to be looking at the entire corridor, the entire 41st Avenue block, and then we need to go back and start over. You see what I mean? So I'm just wondering if it's a little cart before a horse or... Yeah, we do have limited funds for this study and 110,000 would be um, definitely a corridor study kind of on the light side. <laughs> I'm um, very focused because uh, the limited funds that are there in order to do this study. So I, I don't think with 110,000 we could go further south uh, than this, the current city boundary. That brings up a question for me. Um, for the RFQ process submission deadline of February 2025, what exactly is going to happen in February 2025 is that the beginning of the process or the end of the process it's the very beginning so That's then we'd be bringing it back to you know with um 
the holidays coming up and then just building enough building in enough time for qualified professionals to submit a, a whenever you whenever we have a um, deadline in January it's really hard to get difficult to get submittals because people take so much time off in December and around the holidays so that that's why the February did and then can um, somebody remind me what the timeline for the strategic plan is and how our goal is to bring, I think, bring the project to conclusion this winter. That's the plan. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yes. So they would really um, be stacked in an advantageous way already. Yeah, right? this, this project, I think the work around this project would be kicking off probably around the time the strategic plan is being completed. And then regarding the um, possible annexation, do you have any idea how long that process might take? Because in my mind, that's a very big if, and seems like it would take years probably. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to postpone any progress on the 41st Avenue corridor based on this very small percent chance occurrence that will take many years to accomplish. Yeah, I couldn't really comment on a timeline for the annexation study. We are embarking on it, but it's it's very much conceptual. This is a first step in that regard to see if there's any financial interest. We're not, uh, yeah, we're, we're we're not. <laughs> just to be clear, yeah, we're not moving forward with any annexations at this time. So I guess I, I would think that adjusting any of our plannings for the city of Capitola based on any future annexation plans would be putting the cart before the horse rather than the latter. Okay, uh, my questions were already asked. So we will go to public comments. Hi, welcome back. Hi, I submitted um, the comments already, but I do want to share with folks who didn't uh, get to read it. <clears throat> so I have some concern, concerns regarding the proposed concept because the city has already funded two visioning documents in 2029, I mean, no, 2009 and 2011. And those led to minimal changes in the zoning and really no significant development, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Olive Garden is the one development that happened uh, within the last, I don't know, eight years. Um, rather than spending another $110,000 on another in, you know, visioning document, I think the city would be better served by building a larger budget over the next couple of years and applying for grant funding for, for a specific plan. I know, you know, City of Santa Cruz has a downtown specific plan. Watsonville also has a downtown specific plan. And I think the Watsonville downtown specific plan costs about $800,000, but they were able to get half a million in grants. So that's the city paid about $300,000. If we're spending $100,000 this time, if we save up $100,000 for the next few years, with the, the inf more information from the strategic, strategic plan, as well as perhaps the LAFCO study about annexation, we can expand the project wider and really truly have a specific plan, which can be adopted by ordinance and used as a regulatory document. Um, and it has a potential to truly transform the area. Um, the housing element already laid much of the groundwork for a specific plan that we can build on and a specific plan for the corridor would allow us to focus on more than just the Capitola Mall site, including Clare Street and Capitola Road and any of the other streets that we're looking at um, uh, expanding and changing. Um, drafting a specific plan would involve a large amount of community input and resulting in a reflection that, reflecting what the residents want to see um, I think if we're really serious about revitalizing the 41st Avenue corridor, that this level of investment, we need to be able to make this level of investment. Um, if not, we'll end up spending $110,000 um, and you know have another pretty visioning plan on the shelf. Because like I said, two other visioning plans and we don't have much to show for it. Thank you.
Thank you. Hi, welcome back. You know, my wife hates me, uh, it's that she brought me this evening. Um, two comments for you. One is, if you debate in high school or college, um, you know that you have to come up with a plan for the affirmative aspect, but the big key is you learn in winning debates that you have to have an enforcement. So the biggest problem I have with this plan is the fact that there's no aspect in terms of looking at the enforcement for whatever the plan's gonna be. And I think it's a disservice to our police department that you're that as part of the qualification for the plan, that you're not putting in the aspects, you've got the comments on the safety, but you don't have the aspects of relegating the safety and how the police department will be able to enforce whatever that plan is. Okay. Secondly, um, the several of the council members has already brought it up and I totally agree with the comments. I think the cart's way before the horse. Until 40, we know what we're doing with 41st, I think it's a waste of money. Thank you. If you could just come up to the mic so that we can, so that those can. What is the annexation referred to? I've never heard of that one. Everyone else knows. Thank you. When we return from public comment, we'll ask for a, a brief um, summary of that. Hi, welcome back. Um, I'm concerned about I'm questioning the hiring of companies from other locations, distant locations, to be paid a lot of money for preliminary studies, uh, like the one that's coming up. El Segundo is right next to the Lo Los Angeles International Airport. I'm just concerned that we're not getting enough local input into the situation before we hire out to somebody who's never been here before. This reminds me of all of the traffic studies they have done over the years for Capitola Village. We had studied traffic and parking to death here. And it's still the same problem. Anyway, I would like you to think more locally than you do outside the area when you decide that you're going to spend all this money on studies because it's going to affect us. It's not going to affect the people that are advising you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? OK. Oh, yes. Hi again. Uh, I don't live in Capitola, but I reside in Live Oak and I do a lot of my shopping over in Capitola. I, I walk and I bike and I drive uh, through the area. And I guess I just, at this point, it's preliminary, but I just want to express, uh, you know, support for the vision and the concept of looking, taking a look at 41st Avenue and, and really trying to wrestle with a lot of these uh, concepts that have been tried other places but haven't been tried here. And so I think like that thinking and that exercise feels like a valuable one. And there is some grant funding that expires and as an organization that has that same situation, um, if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you can't use it on anything else, I would just uh, voice my support for taking the step to, to get it a little more crystallized. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any further comments? Seeing none, uh, we will bring it back to council. And then before we move forward, if we could just get, um, I guess we could just state that the council at our, was at our last meeting, approved an annexation study. Um, can you give like a brief summary of what an annexation study is for those who weren't, I, I could do it, but I don't think I do it as well as you can. Of course. So really quickly, the city has its city limits, which are the city boundaries, and then we have what's called our sphere of influence. And the sphere of influence is a larger area, and it's often an area that the city intends to maybe someday make part of the city. The city's sphere of influence hasn't changed since the 1980s, and we haven't annexed any property into the city and that sphere of influence. So. LAFCO, in which Vice Mayor Brooks sits, 
in their wisdom, when they looked at the city and what we were doing, said, you know, Capitola, this is in there every five years, they do an evaluation of kind of how the city is doing. They said, you know, Capitola, you've had this larger sphere for a long time, haven't annexed it. Why don't you, you need to do a study to see whether or not any of these make sense uh, to move into the city. So that's what we're doing. We're taking a look at sort of the areas kind of to the west of Capitola Mall, to the west of the city limits today, and seeing if any of those areas would make sense to be part of Capitola in the future. But it's kind of just that first step. Thank you. Because I, I do think since we're talking about that, to have the public understand why that matters in this discussion. Um, okay. I will save the rest of my questions till after my colleagues have spoken. Uh, Katie, this question's for you. In regards to the grant funding, um, can it be used for anything else? It can. It, it's grant funding to help us implement our housing element. So uh, we're utilizing it for the zoning code updates right now um, that I'll be bringing to you at the next meeting. Uh, but yes, it just it has to be utilized for implementation of the housing element. Um, could could that include? Some of the things, you know, if council were to make that kind of safer streets vision a goal after our strategic plan and we come back in the new year and we make this a, a goal of ours, could that funding be used for something like that since we have till February 2025 to use it or to begin using it? Um, we have to finish using it by September of next year. Okay. So we have some time. We have some time. Yeah. Great. About a little less than a year. Okay. We have time to use the money. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, either one. Yeah, I guess we're on comments now. But yeah, if you have yeah, questions, have you can also ask those. <laughs> yeah. Comments that I have are that uh, I think this is something we need to move forward on. We've been not doing anything for a long time. Um, annexation. If if LAFCO says that's something for us to do and it's good, it's still going to take several years to to get that done. So. I think that we just need to keep moving forward on the project. Anything we can do to help uh, 44 7 a corridor move forward is something I'd like to see be done. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess um, I obviously want us to make improvements on 41st Avenue. I think it's very important. Um, but I'm wondering with the time frame of the strategic planning and gathering that information why we can't wait till we have more of that before getting too far ahead of ourselves or wait, I don't know I don't know if this is happening in like a weird timeline of events but maybe that's just the way I'm looking at it but the, those are my my thoughts yeah just um Comments. I think my interpretation of when I asked that question was that we would have the results of the strategic plan by the time we start this so that we wouldn't be doing those two things at the same time and could leverage the results of the strategic plan for this corridor plan or corridor study. And um, I would just completely agree with Council Member Clark that We've spent many years not doing anything, not doing enough um, for this corridor, for multimodal streets, for economic development. And given that this is takes, what, you know, four months to even begin the process, and we just had this very inspiring presentation from um, the groups who went to the Netherlands. I think we just need to get started on this. So I would, I would highly recommend moving forward. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wouldn't disagree that we need to evaluate the 41st Avenue corridor. Um, the, the issue I have is that we have a scope of work that is asking for consultants to provide innovative, innovative and aligned with our goals um, and our city budget. We're asking folks to come in and to, to um, analyze the 41st Avenue corridor with those things in place. And my concern is that we don't have those things in place for the consultants to do the job that they need to do um, because we haven't 
decided on those things. We have not completed, we have not heard from our community on the strategic plan. We haven't heard from council on our new goals for the new year. It sounds like the money we can punt, um, we can utilize in a different way or we have time to utilize it. So for me, it's not about not doing the work because it is very important, but we still don't know the timeline on Merlone Geyer and what they want to do and how that's all going to tee up to this. So for our consultants to come in, it might just be in fact something that they won't have enough information to provide or to be given in order to provide us what we need, um, which is, um, you know, we want a plan and we want to, want to see what's going to be great about the, the corridor. So my recommendation, my my hope is that we could uh, bring this back to council once we have all of that information to provide to the consultants in order to do the work because they need all of those tools. They need all of that from us. They need those goals um, uh, identified in order to, to really create a cohesive plan. So those are my comments um, and I'm, I'm open to hear more feedback from, from my counterparts. So I have a, a couple I apologize if this has already been stated and I missed it. I'm kind of trying to put a puzzle to picture together here. So we expect the strategic plan to be done by February. Is that what we, where's the February is coming from? Or was it the annexation study we expect to be done by February? Strategic plan, probably adoption February, March. Okay. And then what about the annexation study? Do we know when we expect that to be done? We just had our first project kickoff meeting and I'm seeing six months for the whole project. So that should be wrapping up, I think, April, May. Okay, so May at the latest, I guess, let's, let's assume May at the latest, and we need to spend this money by September. The RFQ itself, just asking for qualifications, that doesn't cost anything, right? That's correct. So just ask, just putting out the RFQ doesn't cost any money. What costs money is once we choose someone based on the RFQ to actually start a corridor plan, that's when the, the money part comes in. So technically, we could tonight authorize staff to issue a request for qualifications, start gathering all the qualifications, because usually that's at least 30 days, right? If not longer, get all the qualifications, that would come back, you know, get all those in November, hold it until, you know, December or February or whatever the case may be, and then, then move forward with the money part of it with the actual all the planning and stuff, because by then we will have at least had the strategic plan done and we could then roll the RFQ uh, corridor plan people into the annexation study people and like make it one big, one big, I'm Italian, I speak with my hands, I can move that. Um, oh, now I still need it, yeah, sorry. Uh, do you get where I'm going with this? I, I okay. do, th that, is, that is essentially what we're proposing is, is that we would ask for actually um, advertise for qualifications through the holidays into February we work with a consultant to try to identify a top team, work on a proposal, and so on. Probably in March would be when the council would see conceivably a scope of work to do the you know, begin to work. The council would have to authorize it, obviously, for us to actually just start moving forward. Okay. That's that's kind of the rough timeline. Uh, frankly, that was driven by the holidays, and it was also driven by the current workload in public works because this is going to be both a real partnership between our planning department and public works department. And they felt like they needed to get through some really important stuff this winter and then could pick this up kind of next spring. So that was kind of the timeline we were envisioning. Okay, so even if we if, you, if we issue the RFQ tonight, we would not expect them, whoever submits qualifications, the council subsequently says these are the people that we want because we like their qualifications. We would not expect them to actually start a 41st Avenue corridor plan until around March. Correct. And by then, we are expecting our strategic plan to be done and we're only a couple months away from the annexation study to be done, so we could potentially put them in contact with the people doing the annexation study so that that could be involved somehow in this corridor plan as like a alternatives analysis or something? It's certainly feasible. Um, you know, I think, I think the annexation plan is gonna look kind of at the sphere and say, you know, here's maybe if we were to break these the whole sphere up into kind of different zones, maybe zones that we might focus on more. And if at the end of the day, the lower 41st Avenue corridor kind of was one of the zones, I think then we could take a look at like, what would it take to expand the scope if we wanted to, to include that portion? You know, we also might want to do it as a subsequent phase because again, the annexation 
plan could take a while if we were to end up actually really. Yeah, I feel, I feel like we're, we're pretty far ahead of ourselves. For me, at least, I'm not quite comfortable talking about like right. we're really just feasibility, sort of assessing the feasibility of, of an annexation. Well, and to what to your point, what you just said, if the, if this were to start in March and the annexation study study would be expected to be done in May, then would we expect this um, corridor plan to be done by May, or would they still be working on it? Which at that point they would be able they would be able to use the annex study annexation study within there. I expect the corridor study to take somewhere between four to six months. Yeah, okay. So there would be, even if we issued a request for proposal tonight, there is an opportunity for all three of these studies, the strategic plan, the annexation study, and the corridor plan, to all kind of end up in a Venn diagram where in the middle, they're all connected. Yes. All right. That's all. If I, if I can add, you know, so I'm reviewing the requests for qualifications. And so what Mayor Brown just said would be the perfect scenario in a perfect world if it all teed up, right? Um, and so the request for qualifications to, again, the consultants, it just needs to be really clear. And as all of these additional things come into play, it's going to cost us more money at the end of the day. And to our speaker's point of this is going to cost more money to do such a complete review of the corridor, I think council just needs to be prepared that more than likely this will come back and it will cost us more money to ensure that all of those things in the Venn diagram for the consultant to review is, you know, it's, it's going to take more time than I think the four months and again in what the, um, the scope is here um, for the RFQ. So I, I just want I just want to highlight that that you know this little piece of, is just a piece of the puzzle in in reviewing and making this plan because there's so many other things it's not just going to cost us this hundred thousand dollars and it is only going to just be a high arching plan that's conceptualized and it, it's not real stuff that's going to get done on the corridor so I just want to share that with council and that's really where my concerns are coming from that this is not, this is a plan and it's not going to happen. You know, it's it, there's a lot more to it too. Just like we've been waiting for the mall. Right. Well, I, I agree with that. I just think that we're not really putting our necks out there financially right at this time, right? Where I mean, it's going to come back to us regardless. Mm -hmm. So, I like I I totally understand, and I I want I, I want that perfect storm of that Venn diagram, and I don't even know if that's possible. But um, you know, if we can get to that point that would be great i don't it, the annexation it sounds like we're talking more about like the west side of 41st so is that still considered the 41st corridor like how is that really going to affect open spaces of 41st avenue i mean since i sit on lapka i can just or i used to i no longer <laughs> thank you for her for mentioning that but um it could, you know, so in the annexation, which is totally separate, and so we have to be careful about how much we talk about it because, you know, it's still being reviewed. But there could be an additional, the the rest of 41st that is not in the city limits could be okay. become within our city limits. Who knows how that's gonna, how long that's gonna take, or how? So, you know, that's why I brought it up with this this potential corridor plan because we're only going to be reviewing three blocks of 41st not all of it because it's not within our city limits. Um, and also why I brought up my concern about this is because we don't have the full plan for the mall. And so again, we're gonna have these consultants coming here and saying, you know, what do you wanna do without, again, really concrete information. So I'm, again, you know, another study on the shelf would just be a real bummer, but what I'm hearing is that we're not spending $100,000 today and that we're just putting this out, I guess my request would be that we really be clear on the qual the request for qualifications to the consultants um, about all of these things are coming up and all of these things need to be included in the review of this plan. And that's what I'd like to see, that the consultants are very clear on, on that. And I think along those lines, and I don't know if I speak for everybody, but after some of the comments, um, I think I know it's been very hard with a lot of these larger projects that we've done, but to really look at people that are a little bit closer to where we live and or are from an environment that's similar to the 41st Avenue, maybe 
whoever was involved with the the one that used uh, the West Arden Arcade. Um, just want to agree with the speaker that uh, we do. I think that's where we're, we'll probably get the best outcome and like the best understanding of what our our city needs. Yeah, I'd like to add that we're, we're talking about a lot of unknowns. Um, I think that we need to just focus on what we do know and we, we need to know that we need to move forward. So I think um, if we're not paying for it now and we can make uh, the final decision later, let's do it. Let's move forward. Is that a motion or does someone want to make a motion? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we follow staff's recommendations. Second. For the RFQ. I just want to make sure that staff has the information on the adjustment to the statement of qualifications needed for the consultants. We can have some of those more clear um, points that were made about ensuring that information from the, the ongoing studies from the strategic plan are included in the, um, in the plan that's created. So I just want to make sure that the consultant knows that. So we're not asking for proposals right now. We're just asking for qualifications. Right. And as I read the qualifications, it's not very clear about, it's like really, really high level. And I just want to be clear to the, to when this goes out to, for as an RFQ, that the folks who apply for it are very clear that there's more information coming to them. And it's not clear here to me. It's really, really high level. Yeah, I, I think we should clarify that with the RFQ process, they'll be telling us how they, they're quali qualified to do this project, but they will also provide their recommended approach to the project and what they can accomplish within our budget as well. So um, so I, I can add that information to the RFQ, and then that will be part of the the feedback that we get. That I, And then I'll be bringing that to you in February or March. Um, those different proposals and what can be accomplished and at that time we can make a decision move forward. Okay, so my motion will stand. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on now to our item 8C, Capitola Mall Redevelopment Land Use Study. Is that still you, Katie? Yes. yes. Yeah. And um, to see you again. Thank you. Um, and we have our consultants, um, uh, Cosmont Companies, Ken Hira on, I think it will be doing the presentation. And Ken, if you could put on your camera, we can do a quick sound check. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so Ken here is the president with Cosmont Companies, and Ch Tom Jervoski is a senior advisor with Cosmont Companies, and they're here tonight to um, to give a presentation on the Capitola Mall um, redevelopment land use study. And this was launched um, over a year ago, and then we put it on pause as we were going through our housing element update due to uh, getting feedback during our housing element of uh, feedback from Merlone Geyer at the mall asking for um, specific height increases and floor area increases. And we said, let's, let's do some analysis on what's feasible at the mall in terms of economic development. Um, and that's why this study, which was expected to only take about three months, is now coming to you a year later because we really needed to work through our housing element adoption, which happened in August. And... Um, from that, I'll let you take it from here, Ken. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Madam Mayor and members of the council, my name is Ken Hira, president of Cosmo Companies. My colleague, uh, Tom Jarofsky, is also on. He's a senior advisor. And we've been working um, on advisory services at some capacity with the city of Capitola for probably the last five years. Um, including you know evaluation of the mall and and its its redevelopment opportunities um in the middle of that you know there was um sort of the pandemic and housing element and all kinds of impacts 
to land use. So here we are today with a high level evaluation of some potential incentives. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and the report that you all have in your packets um, is a little more robust than what is here. So I'm gonna try to present high level bullet points, if you will, to uh, what we've researched for you all. And in general, just as a broad statement, regional malls are, uh, all, all regional malls for that matter, are in need of reimagination. Um, they're very good candidates for mixed or blended use. And the real goal for, I think, communities and for the owners of those malls is to try to create a balancing act, a balancing act between uh, obsolete retail, which would include department stores uh, and other large scale, you know, retail formats, but a balancing act between what retail makes sense that's left and other land uses. Um, residential is a very compatible land use, frankly, with retail and <clears throat> um, other commercial uses can be com compatible as well with retail, but it's a balancing act. And so some of the key market conditions and potential incentives for commercial development uh, include land use approvals. The land use approvals or zoning um, ends up being a very powerful tool for cities. And that balancing act can come through uh, zoning measures. Another tool, if you will, is conditional use permits or development agreements for large scale projects. Development agreements are negotiated between cities and developers, and they both get something out of a development agreement, both parties, cities and the developer. Um, but the terms can really help dictate, you know, certain important land uses that are part of that balancing act where residential today is driving a lot of high residual land value, high value out of property. So that's the profit proposition for the developers, but the fiscal impact to cities varies based on those land uses, whether it's all residential or residential along with some other tax generating or um, community driven uses like hotels, restaurants, entertainment uses. The profits for developers from new commercial is in fact lower than residential. As I said, residential is one of the highest land values. Um, and, and so therefore the city may need to consider incentives to reduce the risk. And this is all toward the notion of how do we incentivize development? Next slide, please. <clears throat> Vertical mixed use uh, pretty obviously is uh, this little uh, caption on the left and the bottom where you've got commercial on the bottom of uh, residential above it and a more horizontal mix or blend of uses would be where those uses are adjacent to each other. And I think uh, in Capitola's code, uh, there's not a real requirement for vertical mixed use. In fact, the um, notion of horizontal use at the mall site, I think is embraced. And vertical mixed use is just, it needs to be really market driven. And a lot of the retail on the bottom floor of residential has not really worked very well. They need to be in very urbanized environments and uh, those projects tend to be pretty costly. Next slide. Hotels, they're really ideal uh, commercial uses to incorporate into this blend of land uses. I just read an article today by ICSC, which is the organization that um, is kind of the retail industry group organization. And I just read an article about how compatible hotel and retail uses are. So you see a lot of that just because of how the consumer uh, perceives the experience and the um, the nature of the of the um, you know leisure and experiential uh, uses that hotels and retail frankly offer. So they're very compatible in our estimation. Um, the profit back to the profit for the master developer uh, again is not as high uh, at four as compared to residential. And the reason I keep bringing that up is because at the end of the day, if we're talking about the mall, there are multiple landowners, but there is one that has the majority of land use. And 
if there's not a profit proposition for the developers, uh, they won't move forward. And I think, unfortunately, we've seen that based on, again, a variety of things, buying property, um, a pandemic, the financial markets, which have uh, increased for, in terms of interest rates and costs, they've made a lot of things infeasible. So the public sector just needs to be aware, in a sense, what the private sector is facing when it comes to development feasibility. At the same time, the public sector shouldn't be making decisions that aren't fiscally sound and aren't community driven. So uh, we do look at the profit for the, the um, private sector. And that's why we're coming to some of these con uh, conclusions, if you will, and recommendations that incentives may be um, needed and considered as part of driving commercial and balanced and blended land uses with residential. Next slide. So we've put together a list of potential incentive programs. Um, these programs really are, um, I think the staff report um, states it pretty well. It's uh, examples that illustrate how flexible zoning, public-private collaboration, and the strategic use of incentives can lead to successful redevelopment outcomes. I, I think that's, that's well put. Um, so we've got a list of those. This is a menu. This is a menu of options that may be used, that may be used uh, in conjunction with each other. They may not be used because at the end of the day, it's it's your decision on what is used. But when we talk about fee waivers, and I'll explain these a little bit in the following slides, but fee waivers, um, sort of bonus, density bonus concepts, including height limits that are raised, which we've just, uh, Katie ref referred to that as far as your housing element, greater FAR, uh, local tax sharing agreements where there's a financial incentive uh, that helps increase tax revenues and the sharing of it, uh, special districts, tax increment financing districts. I know that uh, we're frankly working with the city of Santa Cruz on those types of districts, EIFDs, as well as um, a climate resilience district or potential tools, CFDs or additional taxes, which are community facilities districts. So there's different districts can be utilized to, that can be established to help pay for infrastructure. Um, infrastructure cost support, this would include uh, bonds and grants, other ways for cities and the public sector to frankly invest in public improvements through, um, through different types of bonds or lease revenue bonds or otherwise and or grants, the grant dollars are available. In fact, when special districts are formed, DIFDs, they tend to get better scoring to get access to grant monies, which are earlier monies in a process. Another potential incentive is, is public parking. Um, it's the funding at, at a lower cost of capital for public parking. Parking is a very expensive concept. If parking or a parking structure is needed and that can be funded or financed at a lower cost of capital at a city, credit rating uh, and it's public, then it can bring a lower cost of capital to an expensive cost of capital private project. Right now, the private sector is facing very high interest rates. Um, Tom and I are working on several projects across the state of California, but we're working on one where the public parking structure or a parking structure, I should say, for a project to, to, to achieve certain density just cannot be built by the private sector. And so the in that case, the city might be willing to build public parking. So again, another incentive. Next slide, please. Uh, the approach here is that we've got a menu of options to help assist uh, with mall redevelopment, pros and cons. The challenges to mall redevelopment, to the mall redevelopment, is that it's really driven by market conditions and economic forces, uh, and the planning and entitlement challenges or limitations. Next slide. Uh, the city could establish some objective development standards for commercial development to help that balancing act and the blend with residential at the mall site. An example of that is 25% of gross area on the site could be retail or restaurant or hotel. A thousand new units, for example, would equate to 300,000 square feet of commercial um, to be retained or added. So there's formulas that, that can be achieved or that can be pursued or that can be considered. Again, public sector, you're, in your case, the city is trying to help incentivize and, and yet get 
something in return. You have to have a positive fiscal return on a project if you're going to move forward with it. So there's two sides to that equation. Um, the use of a development agreement is, um, we think, a good idea because it gives both parties, you know, mall owner and city, <clears throat> certain uh, benefits. And those benefits, you know, tend to outweigh any drawbacks to negotiating a complicated development agreement. But a development agreement is a common way to achieve um, the longevity of a project where both parties benefit. And then <clears throat> enhancements and incentives, uh, to be clear, you know, we can never create a direct correlation or a guarantee that the mall is going to get redeveloped in a timely fashion. Frankly, as we've worked on this for a few years, and <clears throat> costs have probably gone up by 40% in the last few years, and interest rates have gone up by 500% or 500 basis points, um, it's really caused a lot of challenges with the feasibility of development. So what we're finding in other cities is you're not alone. And some of these ideas, incentives, uh, the challenges to development feasibility, they're pretty commonplace today. Next slide. So here's just a caption of the mall. You can see the ownership by MGP, uh, which is generally in the blue. But to be clear, the properties that are in the red, um, Target, Macy's, Ross, Olive Garden, and another pad, a couple pads, are not owned by the mall owner, uh, by the majority owner, by MGP. Uh, so there will need to be some collaboration. There's agreements that um, tie these malls together, their CCNRs, covenants and restrictions. And um, those agreements tend to also have a, uh, they pause for the navigation of redevelopment. There's striped areas, which are hard to see. Frankly, those are further control areas. I'm working on another mall deal, several mall deals. I'm working on another mall deal. And it's finding the needle in the haystack where um, there can actually, redevelopment can actually take place outside of restricted areas. Uh, so that, that's the art and science behind redeveloping a mall. Next slide, please. So we get into detail about those various tools. Um, I don't want to read every single word on every slide here. I just want to get through the high level uh, for these examples. But in the, in the case of fee waivers, we've seen it where development impact fees can be reduced. Um, there can also be credits given to developers for diff based on previous uh, payment for commercial square footage. Uh, another option would be diff development impact fees could be uh, reduced or relaxed after a certain um, amount of commercial development is is brought to fruition. So there's there's hurdles and thresholds. Sacramento County has an established diff fee program. Uh, if diff fees aren't paid, to the city on the front end of a project necessarily, and there's a trade-off for that, it's early revenues, perhaps not uh, paid to the cities, but the idea is to incentivize the tax base for um, for the earlier years in the, in the next cycle. So it's a trade-off. Uh, next slide, please. This is an idea of some bonus uh, residential floor areas for a trade-off for different land uses. Um, the, the idea of having greater FAR, now we've already gotten to probably 75 based on the, the housing element, which still needs to go through the zoning changes, et cetera, and a 2.0 FAR, which still needs to go through the zoning changes. But this is just the notion that additional FAR, additional height limits, if you will, can potentially be a trade-off for certain commercial uses. Um, cities across the, state are, across the state are using these types of density bonus programs, and there's a, a trade-off for it. Um, the increasing, increasing commercial land value for a residential unit to the developer could be twenty-five to 50000 bucks of sort of profit based on land value in additional units. And if Capitola could achieve or the developer could bring to fruition a hotel or a revenue stream that's equal to a hotel, a TOT, 
of say half a million bucks a year, that's how that trade-off can take place. Next slide. Uh, tax sharing agreement, the, the fact that hotels generate a significant amount of tax revenue through transient occupancy tax is used um, in our experience, and we've been in the middle of those deals, is used or can be used as a city's currency. In other words, a city could trade and incentivize um, with the developer for a return or reimbursement of some of that TOT over time. Things can be prescribed, things can be based on hurdles, uh, things can be um, targeted for a certain dollar amount, and then the deal can stop. So there's lots of ways to creatively potentially structure tax sharing agreements. Next slide. Uh, EFD, EIFDs and CFDs, as I mentioned before, the creation of, of um, a tax increment financing district called in, Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District, or uh, even a, a relative of that, which is the Climate Resilience District, as I mentioned before, which is really climate driven, which may be appropriate, frankly, for the area. These can be coupled with community facilities districts, which are early dollars. And we may, we give an example here of a fiscal or financial impact, which if the project had $500 million of assessed value, um, there could be a certain revenue stream that's gained from property tax and VLF, your uh, vehicle license fee, and that tax increment can be leveraged. And the leveraging of that can turn into a bond issuance at some point when the, when the assessed values hit the rolls. And, and at, a, at half of that tax revenue without county participation, there could be, you know, in the neighborhood of a $3 million EIFD bond at some point. Next slide. That's just an example. Um, the idea of infrastructure cost report, again, is where cities can potentially assist with funding offsites or funding public improvements. And again, for a prescribed period, we use an example here of what we did in Southgate years ago. And the offsites were largely paid for by the public sector through a bond issuance. Um, but the way we structured that public private deal is there was actually profit participation by the city because the city got the project off the ground by investing in offsites and the developer recapitalized and ended up giving a, a by design and legally the, a windfall of profit participation to the city of Southgate. Next slide. So here's just a summary of all of those, and then we can wrap it up here. But uh, it's the different incentive programs as a menu, some options to think about, cost to the city, benefits to the city, complexity to the project, and potential value to a project. Um, so I think on that note, we are we we've done other things within our report. We actually ran some performas. Uh, so the report might have some more detail on it, but that was the summary presentation of the material. Also, I think within the staff report and staff packaging, um, there was a report that we did in 2019 that was an evaluation of fiscal analysis and evaluation of the proposed project at the time, which I think had 637 units and uh, you know hundreds of thousands of square feet of retail and the fiscal impact in that case dating back to 2019, so lots of assumptions <clears throat> that are five years old per se, uh, was such that the fiscal impact of that project as presented was about a break even. And so the notion of trying to drive additional revenue generating uses like a hotel was where that came from. And we had an estimate of what a hotel could generate. Again, could be in the neighborhood of 500,000 bucks a year. On that note, uh, I can't see anybody on the screen, so I don't know whether. Um... Thank you. We can, we can see you and a pre oh, we see a lot of you now. Sorry, we've got a technical glitch on our end. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, um, just just the challenge of of uh, Zoom. I appreciate we certainly appreciate being here at nine o'clock at night and not having eaten dinner, Jamie. Um, anyways, I'm just giving Jamie a hard say, Andrew, a hard time. Uh, but do. I couldn't see you. I couldn't see your faces or expressions, so I didn't know whether you were tilting your head, nodding your head, lifting your hands, and saying, "What the heck are, are we talking about?" But, anyways, uh, we are available for questions. Thank you.
Thank you. We appreciate your time and work on this, and we'll get to uh, questions right now. Councilmember Clark, questions? Not a question. Councilmember Morgan? No? Councilmember Peterson? I have a quick question um, regarding a, a letter we received on behalf of Merlone Geyer stating that the Cosmont study's fundamental conclusion is that mandates for commercial use on site, whether that use is retail or hospitality, will render a redevelopment proposal economic or uneconomic. And I didn't get that from the study or from your presentation, and I wanted to hear from you if you believe that statement is accurate. Sure. Um, I do like to put myself in other folks' shoes. Um, I, we understand the private sector. We understand the world of development. Uh, frankly, we understand Merlin and Geyer, if that makes sense. I also worked on the Laguna Hills Mall, just to be very clear. They were the developer. Um, it was quite the up and down process, but the project got approved. And it was a blend of uses that ended up with residential and retail and hotel and a park and office, which is gonna be a real challenge to build because the market changes. So we finally got to that project and came to fruition. Their point in the letter could very well be that, as I tried to mention during my presentation, our presentation is that um, residential is driving the highest land value, residual land value profit, if you will. Uh, I, I can't see anybody on the council. I can just see myself. So I don't know what happened to the screen. So please, you you can carry on, Ken. We can see you, although we we can see you and we can hear you. Okay, yeah, it's just hard to look at myself and uh, try to convince <laughs> and, and communicate. Um, so the point is, is that the profit that they're going to derive from development is going to come from residential, and I we understand that. Um, the profit that isn't going to come from a hotel is part of their point. And they've been saying that for a long time. But at the end of the day, a city, in our opinion, um, is going to be hard pressed to embrace, explore, negotiate a project that isn't fiscally sound or positive. And, and, and please, I'm the one, we're the one saying to the community that residential projects are not always as a foregone conclusion, negative fiscal impacts. We don't, we don't believe that. Residential projects can be positive fiscal impacts. So the point here is that as we analyzed it in 2019, we saw that given the cost of services, and we did some interviews with some of your department heads, and we looked at the tax creation and tax value of those number of units and the mall, and our analysis showed that it was about a break even. Um, so sometimes those are negative fiscal impacts and, and other times they can be positive. In any event, the residential was a break even. So the whole point was, what can we do as a city to help drive a positive fiscal impact and with a hospitality use, which is a good blend of uses and good compatibility with retail, as I mentioned before, and residential for that matter. And frankly, I believe there's probably market uh, demand for a hospital, for a hotel use. Uh, it made sense for us to come to that as a possibility for the blend of land uses. If it isn't profitable to the developer, and residential is profitable, and your housing element is um, certified, and it requires rezoning for the residential, I suppose that's where their letter's coming from. But to conclude that the project is completely infeasible, I, I can't really, we can't really say that without analyzing it, to be quite honest. Thank you. Okay, thank so you. I, I'm uh, sorry if that was a long-winded answer, but 
there's actually a lot to that analysis. And um, we, we understand both sides of the equation, but that, that's, that's the reality of what's going on as I explained it. I appreciate that. Um, I, have a, I have a question. So in your, um, what do you call this? Financial feasibility analysis in exhibit two, the residential land value multifamily, you have, um, you're looking at 880 units with a base rent of three, $3,800 a month. And then there's a note that making that five or 10% higher would make this a more profitable project for the developer. So with 10%, we're looking at $4,180 a month for one of these units. Is that, I'm, I'm, I, I guess this is an assumption that all of the units are the same price. There's no affordable units built into this. can't remember whether if we had an assumption of a certain percentage affordable or not we, that was we didn't include that in the um in the presentation um so I would have to apologize I, I can't I can't be sure if we uh, what we included for affordable units yeah I don't I don't see anything about affordable units anywhere in either of the um financial feasibility analysis analyses now sorry okay so um, I think that your I think the city policy allows uh, in lieu payments instead of inclusionary units. So maybe that was the assumption we made. It, it's been it's been many months since we did that analysis. Okay, thank you. Is that that is in fact correct for rental housing? There's an in lieu fee, and that was incorporated into their into their I think their overall model. So we could end up with 800 yeah, that's, units that, that cost 41. That's correct, and each. and I'm I'm looking at it as we speak myself. Um, you're, you're correct. There's, it's, it's really a fee instead of units. Okay. Um, yeah, the, you want to talk about what the in-lieu fees are? Sure. So when there's a development and if it's a for rent development, they can pay an in-lieu fee, which would go towards our affordable housing fund. Um, and for rental, it's $6 per square foot, whereas um, typically you, play, you pay you, a developer who's doing a for sale development, it's an inclusionary requirement that 15% of the overall development be deed restricted, low, very low income to meet our requirement. Okay. Um, there was discussion about the bonus floor area ratio. Didn't we already do that? For this for this project didn't we already give a bonus floor area ratio as part of the housing element so in the housing element we um we've committed to doing increased heights up to 75 feet as well as removing the parking garages from our floor area ratio i plan to bring that forward in 2025 for implementation into our zoning code we just um with all the changes that we're bringing forward next next at the next meeting uh, we just haven't had time to do that yet. So that's going to happen in 2025. But we already approved it. Essentially, it's going to happen. It's already been approved. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I will save my comments for after. All right. We will go to public. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Councilmember Peterson. Can you, um, expand upon when in 2025. Do you have a specific month or quarter um, for making those changes? So the changes need to be adopted by December of 2025. Okay. Yeah, the year. Okay. And then um, I have a kind of a general question for you, Katie. Um, now that we have this menu of possibilities, now that we have this menu of possibilities, what, what are the next steps in how to uh, hone down that into actionable items and implementation? Sure. So um, with the menu of items, as you just indicated, the first step is going to be updating our zoning code to reflect the changes that we've committed to. But then within the menu of changes, it's really um, bringing back suggestions to the council of which items you'd like to see us utilize as redevelopment tools for them, if, if it's just for the mall site or if we want to do um, 
identify an area broader than the mall for any of these tax incentives, but really um, continuing this conversation. Now we've got a good starting point, but really um, continuing this conversation of which tools we'd like to use in the future. And I think the last slide that Ken provided that compares um, just the, the cost and time associated with each of these is a great tool, is, is a great way to compare, compare how we can implement in the future and which ones. Yeah, great. And um, to my knowledge, Merlone Geyer has not commented on any of these um, menu of incentives. Is, right. I didn't see anything specific yeah, I think in their letter. They acknowledge them in the letter, but they don't because, suggest that one is better than the other in terms of helpful yeah, to them. I wonder if we could you know, at least try to reach out and see if any of these options would be appropriate for them or help them. them yeah, I think that's definitely within the appropriate next steps. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, as far as a city council direction for, you know, taking the next steps with these uh, possible incentives, is that going to be something that uh, you will be bringing back recommendations or through our discussion, just, you know, decide which to really hone in on a little both maybe. So I would welcome Ken's input on this one as well, but I think, you know, in my experience, things like this would typically be sort of worked out through a development agreement, which can be a negotiation with the developer in terms of them saying, okay, here's what we would need to do the project. You know, what we would need to do the project is we would need the city to help out with the offsite infrastructure, and then we would take a look and see, okay, what are the ways in which we can help out with the offsite infrastructure? And we bring back either a CFD idea or an EFID, one of these different ideas that Ken touched on. Um, but it's really, there's kind of the proactive stuff we can do is kind of, that was the last item we were talking about, thinking about the infrastructure in the street, thinking about the zoning. And then when these specific tools, it's kind of really, usually I've seen it as kind of a negotiation with the developer where they're coming forward with their ideas on what they need to help make something really feasible. And Ken, if you have anything else to add, I'd yeah. welcome that input. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Jamie, certainly a um, couple thoughts on that. You know, number one, a lot has, ha a lot has happened over the last several years you know, to the extent that we had a fiscal analysis of a concept plan five years ago, it's just really time to revisit where the market is and where the where we're, where MGP, where Merlin Geyer is in terms of their interest in moving forward with a redevelopment of the project. I think um, based on the housing element and the sort of um, zoning by 2025, I mean, I think that's also what they're telling the city in their letter it, that they, you know, they, they're desirous of that zoning to be in effect. And in a perfect world, you know, if the city has that, has that flexibility, if you will, and, and the zoning approach, the burden um, is on the developer to ideally collaborate with the city. And I think it's us getting in a room or, you know, both parties getting in a room and talking about, what is today's market? What's what's a potential project look like? What are those challenges, financial feasibility challenges, um, entitlement challenges, and and you know what's the financial gap if there is one, and if there is a financial gap or an infeasibility, if you will, it's then exploring those solutions, right? It's understand the problem identify solutions and collaborate to move forward. So that, those, that's how I see it. Thank you. Anything else? No? Okay. We'll go to public comment now on this item. If anyone would like to make comments, now would be the time. Hi, welcome back. Hello again. Um, I just, I, I guess this is more of a question. 
If the residential use becomes 880 units as part of our requirement, could that not decrease the proposed zoning density in other areas of the city? Um, we'll take note of that question when we finish public comment. We'll come back. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. Any further public comment on this item? Good evening, City Council. Uh, my name is Alberto Lustre. I'm here with the Carpenters Union Local 46. It used to be uh, it's, uh, 505. And it's, not a, it's a great document uh, it got put together. But just keep in mind to uh, include some of the labor standards in the uh, in the project as far as uh, local hire, apprenticeship, and the big major thing, healthcare. Uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the projects come into the cities. They don't have any healthcare for the uh, for the workers or the families, and apprenticeship for all the youth and then uh, all the kids coming to school is getting harder and harder to live in the cities, even to afford rent. So I encourage you to put the. Uh, some type of language to protect the uh, labor force. And once again, local hire. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Kim Fry. I live on Bulb Avenue. Um, I don't know, maybe this isn't the time to talk about things like this, but it's really sad to hear that there might not be any affordable units, that's for sure. It's also sad to not hear that there's not, like, when, when is the community going to have input? This is like a jewel of space in Capitola for a community here, and when do their ideas and what they would like to see with this space um, get included in the dream? I don't know. It just seems to be a lot about finances and money, and are they going to make enough profit? And I do have one question to end. 75 feet high, how many um, stories is that? Thank you. Thank you. I just want to remind the council that you also have incentives or requests from the state of adding units into your city. The unincorporated area is, they have three projects they're working, and it's in excess of 500 units. The one at 41st and SoCal Drive, and then Thurber and SoCal Drive, and then another 90 units of senior housing on the Silver Spurs restaurant area. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. We'll start down here, Councilmember Peterson. Okay, um, yeah, I just want to say I'm thankful to um, Cosmot and to Katie for making all this happen, and I think we have some good data to go with, um, and I hope that um, some representatives from Merlone Geyer will be able to work with us uh, to determine which of these incentives may be uh, beneficial to, you know, create an economic project in today's environment. I know we have committed to the um, FAR and height ratio, and I, at this point, wouldn't rule out any of the proposed incentives, whatever we can, you know, do to make this happen. Yeah, um, thank you, Cosmont, for for putting all this information together. As um, you know, I've I've sat on this dais for six years, and the city continuously puts hundreds and hundreds of hours into this. Cosmont has put hundreds of hours. We put many a, a lot of money into studies and evaluation of how we can get this project done. And going back to the table with Merlone Geyer is obviously important. But I, I'm deeply I am disappointed in where we are today with, with the developer. There, we have been over backwards um, as a council throughout all of this time, and um, it's really frustrating. And so I really appreciate what Cosmo has done in bringing um, these ideas forward. But you know, where I stood in 2000, uh, you know, it's six years ago, um, was that we needed to think about our community and think about 
um, what in, in what we were building and, in, and ensuring that as we incentivize more and more for our developer, that we're also creating equal, if not more incentives for our community members. So um, if they're listening, you know, I, I look forward to having them come back to the table as we discuss these as options for them and, and hope that we can get a project done. And then if not, if there's any other folks out there who want to who want to come forward, I'd great, greatly appreciate that as well. So thank you. Yeah, um, I also want to thank Katie and uh, Cosmo. Um, I think I think the menu is a good idea, and I think it can kind of help um, many people conceptualize sort of the different options that we have going on here. I definitely want to hear back um, from the owner developer as far as what they're possibly interested in entertaining and what um, what we really need to do in these first few steps to move forward um, because like vice mayor said it's been it's been a long road and um, we want to make sure we're enhancing the community and not just sitting on a project um, putting time and effort into something that isn't going to come to fruition so I'm thankful to have this information and um, I'm looking forward to the conversations with Merlon Geyer moving forward. Thanks. Nice to see all the hard work put in this. Um, I don't think it's going to go unnoticed for sure. Um, but it does have to work out for the developer and the mall property owners along with the city. So we got to get to that point where we can all agree on something. So we need to continue working on it. Um, I think it can be done. But uh, no time like now to, to get started. We need to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first, just to answer some of the public comment questions, uh, 75 feet high is about seven stories, correct? Six and a half, yeah. Um, and then the question about would the density of this project potentially decrease density of other projects in the areas, I don't, I don't think that's the case, correct? That's correct. And actually, in the state of California, you're not allowed to decrease density um, that's assigned to properties. So. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. The, there, there, well, there will be public outreach once this project becomes a project. Um, there was eight years ago when I first started on the council where we started asking people what they might be interested in. Um, but there will eventually be public outreach. Right now, we're just looking at ways to try to get Merlone Geyer to move forward in doing something. Um, I want to say thank you to, to Cosmont and, and to Katie, um, and I apologize in advance because the frustration I'm about to share is not towards you. I appreciate uh, that they've taken the time to do this study as we've, as we've asked, and I think that they've um, you know, done exactly what we've asked them to do. So thank you both gentlemen for being here tonight and for sharing this um, with us. I've been on this council for eight years, and the question people most ask me about is what's going on with the mall? Why haven't we seen anything done with it? Why is this taking so long? And every year there's a new reason that I have to tell them. Well, there was a pandemic. Well, we're getting them back on the board now. Well, they've got other priorities. And I'm talking about Merlone Geyer in, in particular. Um, they asked for additional floor area ratio, not including the parking garage and the floor area ratio. We did that. Then they wanted 75 feet and almost held up our housing element if we didn't give them 75 feet, and we gave them that. And then they came back at the meeting when we gave them the 75 feet and said that the amount of affordable housing was too much to make the development feasible. So we spread that out over the whole mall property instead of just on their one that one plot. And so now what they're saying is that commercial development is not possible at all, and it makes it infeasible. And they're saying that even the proposed financial incentives are insufficient to mitigate the risk of commercial use on the site. Well, we had no intention in all the time that I've been on council for us to tear down an economic uh, driver in our, in our city and turn it into just residential that's going to be $4,100 a unit for 880 unit. Who the hell is going to live here? That is not housing for teachers and firefighters and police. We've got a development here in the village that starts at $7,500 a unit. And now we're going to have $4,100 a unit for 880 units with no affordable housing and no commercial development. I'm just, I'm flabbergasted and I'm frustrated. Um, I, I can't even imagine the loss of sales tax revenue in that corridor by not having any commercial because it's now deemed 
financially infeasible after the four other things we were told made this financially infeasible had been addressed. So what, what's the next? I'm, I'm just, I'm really frustrated. I'm really frustrated and I'm disappointed. Um, when I ran for council in 2016, I was so excited to work on this project and I've got five meetings left and I know that I will not be a part of this. And it's not about me, it's about the community, but the fact that the community has waited nearly 10 years and what we're hearing just continues to be, sorry, that doesn't work for us. Well, it's not working for us that nothing is happening on this property for the last 10 years. And so um, forgive my, my frankness and my frustration, but I, I expected a partnership with our developer, with the owner of this property to create a development that would be beneficial for both parties and for the community. And in my opinion, getting rid of com uh, commercial, just putting in residential that's not affordable is, is not what, what, we, what we had in mind for this redevelopment. And it's not what I saw in the conceptual plans in 2019 when they brought it to us. Um, so that's it for me. Um, I think there's no action on this, right? We're just receiving a presentation. Thank you, Cosmon. Again, that wasn't that frustration wasn't directed to you. Uh, we appreciate the time that you've put into this. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, item 8D has been continued to a future meeting because I was looking for some additional information that we're still gathering. So that will come back to us at a later time. In the meantime, um, that's it for tonight. So until next time, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Our next meeting will be October 24th here at 6 p.m. Take care.